for 10. Same day, different vows. Okay, we'll start off with a nice bright mood, okay? Let's do this. CBS News reported recently, Fred and Lynette Dubendorf, husband and wife, they were taking a stroll down the beach with their dog, just living the life, right? The ideal picture when they noticed a message in a bottle washed up on the shore. I'd be so excited, first of all, but I'd also be concerned because I have seen Castaway. Could be anything in there, I don't know. This message could go one of two ways, but either way, I'm reading it, what's going on? Could be from Survivor, you know? It could be from an island. Taylor, the tribe has spoken. They opened it and inside they found wedding vows from another couple, Melody Kloska and Matt Bears. Yeah, they had recently got married on a beach on Lake Michigan and word spread rather quickly via the waterways, I guess. Thing is, their wedding date was the same as the couple who found the message. They took it as a sign that both pairs were meant to be, and they sent a surprising letter to the lost couple's address. That'd be kind of creepy though, on one hand, wouldn't it be? Hey, I found that message in a bottle. Here you go. Nice address, by the way. I love the furniture. Are you guys still together? Number nine. Run, rabbit, run. Yeah, so apparently Australia has like every animal in the world except the cute little fuzzy ones. Yeah, every stinger, wing, and venom you can imagine. But no cutesies, no. Well, they do now. In 1859, English settler Thomas Austin had been officially noted for the introduction of rabbits into Australia. Yeah, Auric Tolagus Caniculus, to be exact. Even though rabbits had already kind of been brought over in the first fleet to the land of Oz. Not much, couple here, couple there. But these rabbits, however, yeah, they started migrating across Australia and destroyed around two million acres of land. Ha <laughs> ha pesky widow wabbits. <laughs> yeah, basically excessive overgrazing caused widespread panic, damage, and sickness through and to the vegetation. Mate, they're bloody everywhere, these little devilish kangaroos, mate. Long bloody ears out to here, mate. Fangs down to here. Terrifying little things. Not like they're small, man. Yeah, little hoppy guys. During the 19th century, the country had set up rabbit-proof fences to protect its pastoral lands. Is there even such thing as rabbit-proof fences? Finally, in the 1950s, the Australian government had had enough. Started to use biological methods to control the excessive population. Yeah, sorry, little guys. This guy's bright idea is believed to have an immense impact on the abundance of natural resources in Australia. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Thomas. Now we have no carrots, man. Number eight, legendary musical neighbors. It's weird how similar some of your neighbors are, right? Growing up, we had like three Davids on our street. They're all cops. Isn't that weird? I don't know, I just thought of that. They all loved cutting their lawn at 7 a.m. too. What a coincidence, how weird is that? Well, back in the 60s, rock icon Jimi Hendrix and the 18th century composer George Friedrich Handel, well, they were both neighbors. A couple hundred years apart, but neighbors nonetheless. They both lived in 23 Brook Street and 25 Brook Street in London. Now, had George been born, you know, 200 years later, we'd have gotten the greatest collab of all time. Would have been like Watch the Throne, but times three. If you're a local, of course you'll know there's a site there now, it's a famous landmark and all that jazz. But in terms of coincidences, there's music in the air. Something's going on on Brook Street. Pick up a, an instrument or two, walk by, you know, try the harp out in that room specifically. Number seven, friendly football. I'm actually happy that this really happened and it's not just like a heartfelt Pepsi commercial that they drummed up in a meeting. Growing up, I thought this was fake due to the circumstances, but nope, this actually happened. During Christmas of 1914, a truce was held between Germany and the UK. Like these people were trying to like take each other out, but you know, Christmas is Christmas. They decorated their shelters with lights and colors, exchanged gifts at no man's land, and played a game of football between the soldiers. Yeah, isn't that nice? Soccer, of course, not football, football. They're just like dudes smashing into each other. Both Germany and the UK refused to declare an official ceasefire, but both sides declared a temporary ceasefire on their own. They gathered and celebrated tizzing the season by singing carols, wrapping up gifts for each other, drinking some drinks, laughing some laughs, and of course, a slide tackle or two. Yeah, yeah, captains, captains come to me. Yeah, it's gonna be a red card for Gunther. Yeah, back five, please, I said back five. Okay, go ahead, man. Number six, Yanni and Laurel. Okay, for our halfway point here, we have to throw in a fun recent one as well. This is kind of unbelievable, I don't know. I hope people look back on these in a thousand years, they'll be so confused what happened with Yanni and Laurel. Who were these people? Why do they talk about them so much? Remember this, Yanni, Laurel, back in 2018? I only heard Yanni for like two weeks straight, and then one day I listened and I couldn't go back. It was just Laurel all of a sudden, instead of Laurel. It went from Laurel to Laurel. 
Just like that, my life changed. I don't know what happened there. This got everybody talking. What is this phenomenon that happens? Same with the dress fiasco. Is it blue, is it white, is it gold? I don't know. What the hell is actually happening here? Well, many believe these viral illusions are proof that we're living in a simulation. Yeah, didn't expect me to say that, did ya? These arguments, no, the dress is blue, it's white, whatever. These situations prove that we perceive reality in our own way. Everybody's living their own individual perceived reality, so sometimes it always doesn't align. Sometimes I hear Yanny, then sometimes I hear Laurel. And then I lose my mind. I can't go back now. God, I hated this so much. The dress was in 2015, the Yanni Laurel thing was 2018, so I don't know. We're due for another glitch in the matrix. Will it be an auditory mix up? Will it be visual like the dress? What's next? Either way, I'm out, and I'm not on board. Also, it's blue. Number five, Gaius Valerius Catullus rap battle. Who doesn't love a good beef? Now, Catullus was a major poet. His works moving away from the retelling of classic tales and focusing more on the telling of day-to-day -day life. The personal nature of his works have lived in the minds of thousands, depicting humor, romance, and the beauty of day-to-day -day life. However, Catullus was no stranger to critics. Two of his biggest being another poet, Furious, and Senator or Aurelius. Now, constructive critique can be wonderful for artists. After all, it's the only way that you can improve. However, Catullus seemed to take a different view, writing a poem in dedication to his critics. Commonly referred to as Catullus 16, this poem was so filthy that it wasn't fully translated until the 20th century, and even then, several lines were heavily censored in most publications. Want to hear it? Well, it reads. Number four, Roman birth control. Romans were, well, they got around a lot. Now, unless you want to deal with the immediate consequences of a whole lot of loving, you've got to figure out a way to stay safe. Picking up condoms from a shopper's wasn't really a thing, and Plan B hadn't been invented yet, so what was the plan? Well, it turned out that the Romans had discovered an herb called silphium, which supposedly had contraceptive properties. Whether or not that's actually true remains to be seen, specifically due to the fact that you can't find it anymore. That's right, the Romans were so raunchy, and silphium was so popular popular that they caused the complete extinction of the plant, the last stock of it reportedly being given to Emperor Nero. Now in 2020, there has been a theory presented that there is a similar herb, or a relative, found in Turkey, and it could be the surviving relative of the plant, but to this day, not a sprig of silphium has been found. Apparently, it looks like a heart though. Aww, ecological devastation. Number three, Roman baths. The terms made its way around. Roman baths are synonymous with the country and culture as a symbol of civilization. But you've listened to enough of this list so far, so you can probably figure out where this is going. See, while Romans were known for their hygiene, urine laundry aside, uh, they were usually pretty nasty when it came to bath time. Soap wasn't really a thing, so the baths were basically just huge vats of oil that they just slather up all in there. Now these oils were perfumed, but they were also reused used frequently and were washed off using a strigil, a sort of scraping tool, so you know, just spoon the dirt off. Ugh. Number two, Cato the Younger. All right. Here's a fun one. Marcus Porcius Cato, also known as Cato the Younger, was a Roman senator in the later years of Rome. A hugely influential man. His life was fraught with turmoil and strife. He was also a strong opposer of Julius Caesar's Hellenistic principles. Uh, Cato had no trouble joining the opposition on the brewing civil war. Now, during that civil war, Cato took command of a campaign in Utica. A tough campaign that he generally just planned to abandon alongside the Roman Empire. However, one once they'd been defeated, Caesar moved to pardon Cato's family and allies. Convinced his end was drawing near, Cato took his life against his friends and family's advice, stabbing himself in the abdomen. Now, some accounts claim that he actually drew out his own entrails from his body when the physicians attempted to heal him, ensuring that he wouldn't see Caesar's Rome. And maybe he knew that Caesar was planning to pardon him as well, which Cato would have considered the crueler punishment. Number one. 
Caligula's horse. Ah, uh, we'd be remiss not to talk about the antics of Emperor Caligula. Famed for his strange ways, one of the greatest legends of an already infamous emperor was his attempt to have his favored horse, Incitatus, enlisted as a consul. According to Suetonius's Lives of the Twelve Caesars, this horse was dressed in lush finery, inviting dignitaries to dinners, and according to Cassius Dio, the horse was fed oats mixed with gold flakes and also possibly a priest? Uh, now, a lot of this is left up to debate, and a number of historians will argue that this was nothing more than a prank at the expense of the Senate. While never officially made a consul, this horse has lived on in infamy, inspiring a number of fictional depictions in modern media, including the metal band Caligula's Horse. Regardless of the official status of the horse, the truth seems to be that this was nothing more than an attempt to mock his senators, but what a method of mockery. Number 10, an apple a day. If you threw an apple at somebody today, that would be assault. Yeah, you're not allowed to do that. You can't huck food at people now, then, ever. Let's just not do that anymore. But in ancient Greek days, it was a little different, dare I say. The apple back then had quite the symbolism attached to it. The apple was sacred to Aphrodite. This was a symbol for the goddess of love. So to throw an apple at somebody, that meant you were throwing your heart at them, right? How romantic is that? Just a nice apple with bugs in it. You're like, here you go, there's lunch. Ancient flirting, my friend. The more you know. Maybe those trees in the Wizard of Oz weren't mean. Maybe they weren't mean at all. Maybe they were just trying to express their love by throwing apples aggressively at everyone involved. Number nine, raining iguanas. Okay, we're immediately dipping back into the weird side of this list. Here we go. Back in 2018, this was wild. I read about this and I'll never forget. Lives rent free right in my head. Florida got another odd headline. There you go, classic Florida. This time it was frozen iguanas falling from the skies. Yeah, how do you not pick up that paper, right? Florida got hit with a massive snowfall, their first big one in 28 years. So these cold-blooded guys started to fall from suburban tree branches, right? They didn't see it coming at all. People were just walking to get groceries and iguanas are freezing and falling off trees right in front of them. The craziest thing is that they're just paralyzed. They're not dead, obviously. So later, they would come back to life after they, you know, de-thaw. Sounds so zombie-like when you say it like that. They're just lying there and then all of a sudden they're like, <gasps> what day is it? Was it a snowfall? Oh God, winter has come. Number eight, the Philadelphia Experiment. Okay, a little more darker, let's do it. Perhaps one of the most bizarre tales when it comes to other dimensions, this one has credibility behind it. It pops up on my Reddit feed a lot, so I can't help but not talk about it. The 1943 Philadelphia Experiment. This World War II conspiracy theory takes place on the USS Eldridge, this destroyer class ship. So it wasn't small, it was quite large. A lot of people on board, a lot of heads, a lot of witnesses. And they were conducting on this ship these secret experiments in order to gain power over naval warfare, obviously at the time. Now one of these experiments was to create this technology that makes the ship invisible on radar. That's the important note. It was supposed to be invisible on radar. But when the generators were fired up, the hull apparently lit up with this green and blue light, then the ship itself actually disappeared. Invisible in real life, not just on radar. Boom, gone, just like that. It was then seen at a naval shipyard in Virginia before the same thing happened again, and then it appeared back in Philadelphia. Now this sounds a bit intense, but when you hear about the crew on board, it only gets worse. Some went mad after the dimensional dip, of course, while others had physical effects from this cosmic commute. Yeah, some haunting details in that one, some body parts that got mixed up with, yeah, I can't even talk about it, you get it. If you've seen the Cloverfield Paradox, it's kind of like that, some some blooping and blipping, and then some arms getting stuck in some walls. There we go. Number seven, Ellen Shannon. Heading over to the late 1800s for this one. I gotta warn you, it's of course pretty dark. In 1870, we obviously didn't have the same safety requirements as we do today for anything, like, at all. For example, if you wanted to read before bed, you didn't have a Kindle or an iPad. Hell, you didn't even have a nightlight, but you did have a kerosene lamp. Always coming in handy, those kerosene lamps. See, Ellen had used R.E. Danforther's non-reactive burning fluid. And dare I say, the obvious happened. The fluid reacted. Yeah, her tomb in Pennsylvania reads, in memory of Ellen Shannon, aged 26 years old, who was fatally burned March 21st, 1870, by the reaction of a lamp filled with R.E. Danforther's non-reactive burning fluid. Yeah, they just called him out right there, right in public on the actual tomb. I gotta say, I agree with that, that's cool. If some idiot's gonna cause your horrible demise, yeah, roast them, let people know. Let people know who's responsible. That's like Twitter nowadays, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, just so-and-so is an asshole. Send tweet, Boop. 
and it's there forever. Number six, military dolphins. Yep, I said military dolphins. Here we are, we're almost halfway through our list. We'll get a little more weird now. Iran has plenty of nuclear capabilities, but they also have trained dolphins now too, so. Huh, good game, folks. Back in 2000, Iran bought this fleet of trained dolphins from Russia. Just Russians doing things. But they were trained, supposedly by the Soviet Union, to attack ships, and yes, you guessed it, attack people. We have Navy SEALs and military dolphins. Is this Aquaman 2? What's happening right now? Well, recently, and I mean that as in 2018 recent, satellite photos revealed a Russian naval base in Syria with pens that are commonly used for holding Dolphins. Yeah, so these dolphins are active, perhaps, right now. That's so terrifying. Russia and the US have a fleet of trained dolphins to detect mines, but now Iran is also in the mix as well. So, three powers in the dolphin game. What an odd standoff that would be in the water. They're all eating at each other. Number five, Joan of Arc. Finally, a woman in the Middle Ages. Who'd have thunk? Joan of Arc was considered and still is revered the heroine of France for her role in the Siege of Orleans during France's Hundred Year War with England. Joan of Arc, a peasant with faith on her side, had believed that God had chosen her to lead France in victory against England and had spoken to her since she was young. At only age 17, she had stolen men's armors, a white horse, and like a Valkyrie riding into battle, she had convinced an entire army that she was appointed by God to win. And then did! That's the most badass thing I've ever heard my entire life. After such a miraculous victory, her reputation spread among France, and upon her capture and death at 19, the Maid of Orleans herself would forever live on as one of the greatest saints and symbols of the country of France. Number four, Henry V. Another war? All these people do is kill each other. Doesn't anyone fish? Or golf? No one, huh? Just swords and heads, swords and heads. A history itself. This time, England beats France. King Henry V, Prince Hal himself, leans into his kingly duties, demolishing France and what Shakespeare would delve into years to come. The Battle of Agincourt is one of England's most celebrated victories and was one of the most important triumphs in the Hundred Years' War. Then, should the warlike Harry, like himself, assume the port of Mars, and at his heels, leashed in like hounds, should famine, sword, and fire crouch for employment, Henry V, prologue, good stuff. How come these guys didn't just like rap battle or play soccer or something? Like an arrow right through the chest is way worse than a red card, just saying. Hey, speaking of soccer. Number three, mob football. I'm not talking about the mafia. Put a thousand on Brady, would you? I'm talking about mob football, also known as folk football. It's just like our modern day soccer, town versus town, except it has an unlimited amount of players. And there's only two rules to the game. Get the inflated pig's bladder over the opposing team's lines on the other side of town and no murdering. I mean, I guess this is closer to rugby? Yeah, this, this is literally just rugby. This game was played competitively and eventually outlawed at Oxford University in 1555. Just a guy named Jeeves in a polo. Oh uh, yeah, I play uh, mob football at Oxford. <sighs> yeah, I'm, uh, I'm also in a frat. This game got so out of hand, it was banned numerous times in England. There is great noise in the city caused by hustling over large balls from which many evils may arise, which God forbid. We command and forbid on behalf of the king, on pain of imprisonment, such game to be used in the city of the future. Thankfully, this game has calmed down over the years and now has become the most popular played and watched game across the world. Go Liverpool! Number two, the printing press. The printing press is a machine that was designed for the mass printing of text mostly in form of books and newspapers. With an unknown date of origin, first invented in China, this machine designed in the 15th century by Johannes Gutenberg was a revolutionary new form of writing which would only change the direction of history with the mass production of uniform text. Eh, long story short, people didn't have to get the world's worst wrist cramp writing Hamlet over and over again. To be, or not to be, 86 more folios? The alphabetical metal keys would be placed into the device and slammed into the paper, pressing ink upon the parchment. You know there's gotta be some books half written in purple ink cause they just ran out of black. Come on, we've all been there. Ink's expensive. Number one, William Shakespeare. The bard himself, arguably the most influential writer of the English language. William Shakespeare was born in Stratford, England. One of the easiest ways we can look back into the dialogue and lifestyle used by the people living in the Middle Ages. This playwright documents the world in which he lives from 1564 to 1616. Due to Shakespeare's unbelievable talent for building and fabricating an array of diverse stories and characters via players, 
Modern day is able to see the Middle Ages and the similarities and differences the people were experiencing. His plays are based in the environment that they were written in. He writes about diseases, he writes about monarchy, he writes about women's rights. Okay, so no one actually got turned into a donkey by some fairies in the woods, but some of those wars actually did happen. And some of those kings and queens were really twisted. How this man created so many brilliant works and stories, all part of the mystery. What do you think? Genius? Or did the guy have some help? One man in his time plays many parts. Number 10, the first marathon. Now the term marathon right off the bat, it comes from ancient Greek history, the Battle of Marathon. I've certainly mentioned on this channel a few times, but let's look further a few hundred years, give or take. The first ever Olympics marathon. It was an absolute shit show. Seven miles from the finish line, one guy started ingesting strychnine and egg whites just so we could finish the race. So yeah, that was the first ever modern use of narcotics and an official Olympic game sport. One dude was also running the marathon in dress shoes and dress pants. Just a classy lad with 58 blisters just booking for hours at a time. William Garcia, one of the 32 competitors, straight up almost died during this marathon. He collapsed mid-race. He barely made a recovery. Have you done a marathon before? If so, tell me your experience down below. I did the Toronto Marathon a month ago and I got 35 kilometers out of 42. I was so close it hurt my soul. If only I wasn't wearing those dress shoes, you know, maybe I would have finished. So close. Number nine, unsinkable Sam. In our last video, I asked who likes dogs and who likes cats and yada, yada, yada. This one here, I'll give to the cat people. You get one. Cats have nine lives. I'm a firm believer in this theory now. Unsinkable Sam was the nickname for a cat who survived several shipwrecks during World War II. His tail began aboard a German warship called the Bismarck. Yeah, also imagine that image right there. 2,200 soldiers just standing in a line, and then also this black and white cat that somehow snuck aboard. Nobody knows how it got on, but I'm pretty sure one guy does. He's like, the Bismarck was decimated during one of the attacks, of course, and while the HMS Kozak was looking for survivors shortly after, they saw Oscar, the cat, on a plank. Yeah, he had to earn the unsinkable Sam alias, all right? You get a new life, you get a new name, then, then it happens. The HMS Kozak hauled him aboard, but then several months later, the Kozak was destroyed. Now this time, it was the HMS Ark Royal who spotted the cat, and then the fearless feline was dubbed Unsinkable Sam. Little man passed away in 1955, not on a warship, so that's great. I hope there's therapy in cat heaven, my god. He's like, well, four out of the nine sucked. I don't know. Number eight, Robert Liston. In the early 19th century, crowds would gather to watch Dr. Robert Liston work, okay? They would huddle around like it was a dance battle. They get nice and close and breathe in each other's mouths. He was known as the fastest knife surgeon in the West. I know, how many red flags can you find already? A crowd, a fast surgery, this guy just in the middle of it. What's going on? Like, please help me. Please put me together. I don't know. This was a time before anesthesia had been developed, so you wanted things wrapped up quick. Pun intended. Now, Robert, he would have you amputated and sutured in three minutes flat, right? Don't you want that? Don't you want a nice fast surgery? Mortality rate was 300%. Not great at all, in fact. And then one fateful day, Robert attempted to beat any record previously held. He was trying to perform the fastest surgery, but during so, he accidentally cut off his assistant's fingers as well as the patient's leg. So, I don't know what the guy's doing with his arms, but you're like, buddy, slow down. We got more than three minutes, it seems. He also hit somebody else watching by accident. You know what I mean? Remember how I said crowds would gather, the old surgery crowd? This is why you don't stand too close, okay? It's like crump battles. You get too close, you're getting nicked by something. Either Robert or some guy in Tim's. Both are gonna hurt. I'm glad surgeons are taking their time now. I'm also glad no surgeons are trying new experiments at a record time. That's also nice. Can you take your time, please? Number seven, the first open heart surgery. Moving on to some other surgeons, a little better, hopefully. We've discussed ancient Egyptians and how they would clean the entire body out for the whole mummification process and then put the heart back in. Now, of course, they weren't alive during any of this, but when was the first open heart surgery? When did that happen? What did that room look like? The first successful open heart surgery went down in Chicago in 1893. It was honestly unbelievable. The patient was a man named James Cornish. He got a knife wound to the chest during a brawl. It was probably Robert Liston just doing his thing. Maybe he got too close. I don't know. And the surgeon, Dr. Daniel Hale, Williams, who, by the way, used to be a shoemaker's assistant, he saved this man's life and he also made history. In the city's first interracial hospital too, might I add. So a lot of firsts happening in this one. Now there weren't any textbooks on this type of operation at the time, so the odds of survival, of course, were extremely low. In fact, there weren't any odds at all. 
right? No x-rays, no antibiotics, no anesthesia, no problem, right? Using just a scalpel, Dr. Williams cut through his chest, weaved through all the nerves slowly, might I add, thankfully. He weaved through muscles, ribs, everything until eventually he closed a severed artery right near the heart. Cornish survived, thankfully, and come 1894, Williams was promoted to chief surgeon at the Freedmen's Hospital in Washington, D.C. Imagine he went back to being a shoemaker's assistant. He's like, all right, cool. Now I want those shoes. Number six, the Pfizer fine. When we think of the name Pfizer now, there's obviously mixed feelings, pun intended. But back in 2009, before they were making cures, they were paying some hefty fines. The world's largest pharmaceutical company had to pay a record-breaking fine. They had to pay $2.3 billion in criminal and civil penalties over unlawful prescription drug promotions. Now included in this mighty slap on the wrist was a $1.2 billion criminal fee. Now if that didn't sound bad enough, in the agreement was also a criminal forfeiture of $105 million. So you're paying and you're also getting more stuff taken away. It's all bad. This was the fourth time Pfizer got charged with this magnitude in a decade. They were on a pretty bad streak. What got them in hot water in the first place is that they would promote their products at resorts, right? They would invite doctors to these meetings, give them golf, massages, whatever. They'd pepper you up nice so that you were team Pfizer by the end of the trip. And you were all tanned. You looked nice, right? FBI Assistant Director Kevin Perkins says the corporate giant was blatantly violating the law and misleading the public through false marketing claims. Number five, enlisted bear. During World War II, a Polish army unit enlisted a real life Syrian brown bear named Wojciech to serve with them, because yeah, what could go wrong, right? I just watched that bear movie, I don't know. Wojtek had been found as a cub in Iran by Polish soldiers, and of course adopted as their very own mascot. Again, sure, why not? Now as he grew up, Wojtek became an integral part of the unit, right? He helped carry around ammunition and other heavy supplies that only a bear could carry, fair, I guess. And he quickly became popular among the soldiers. They all loved him, they would play with him and feed him cigarettes and beer, you named it. He loved it all, he'd eat the glass, probably. Probably. He even learned how to salute, a skill he would often perform when given um, a bottle of beer. He's like, thank you, sir. Psst. And he'd open it on his nails. So scary. So scary. Washtek's presence helped boost the morale of soldiers, and he became a beloved symbol of the unit's fighting spirit, because why, of course he did. After the war, Washtek was demobilized along with the rest of the unit, and then he spent the rest of his life at the Edinburgh Zoo in Scotland, where he continued to be a, of course, popular attraction. He's like still saluting people and stuff. They're like, it's all good, man. It's all good. You're safe now. You can chill. Today, he's still celebrated as a symbol of the bond between animals and humans and times of war. That's crazy. They got a real life bear to do that. That's terrifying. I just watched a movie about a bear doing some crazy stuff with some illicit substances and it seemed way scarier than that somehow. Number four, Violet Jessup. Violet Jessup was a British ocean liner stewardess who somehow survived three major shipwrecks in the early 20th century. Not one, not two, three. That's crazy. She's known for all these incredible tales of survival and her courage in the face of disaster, again, numerous times. First off, 1912, Jessup was working on board the RMS Titanic when it of course hit an iceberg and sank in the North Atlantic Ocean. She managed to escape on one of the lifeboats, one of the few lifeboats, might I add, and survived the disaster. Just a few years later, 1916, she was working on the HMS Britannic when it struck a mine and sank in the Aegean Sea. Again, Jessup survived and managed to make it to safety. Somehow. Now at this point you're like, okay, she's not gonna do it a third time, right? No possible way. In 1940, Jessup was working on board the RMS Queen Mary when it too collided with another ship and suffered significant damage. So once again, Jessup survived another disaster and went on to work another ocean liner for many years. Yeah, she still worked on ocean liners after all three of those. She's like, oh, it is what it is. Like what? Are you kidding me? Jessup's incredible tale of survival has of course made her a legendary figure in the history of ocean travel and a symbol of courage and resilience in the face of disaster. I'm baffled by this, that's crazy. You think after the second one, you definitely quit, right? Incredible, incredible. Number three, the Dybbuk box. I don't like haunted items. This one here, definitely a haunted item. My ears are draining as I'm doing this, so I'm like, ah. It's getting louder all of a sudden. This small wine cabinet got some attention after being sold on eBay back in 2003. Yeah, remember eBay? Me either. The box was purchased by Kevin Manis. Now, shortly after, he claimed that said box was haunted and it caused him and his family to experience a series of horrifying events and health problems. And of course, paranormal activity. How do you sell that, eh? Hey, want this? 
<laughs> no, not at all. Sounds like it's a terrible idea. He eventually sold the box to Jason Haxton, who ended up writing a book about his experience. Yeah, it was that bad. Some believe that opening this box can release malevolent spirits into the world. Now its origins here go back to a woman who survived World War II. This box came from her estate. So the history behind it, it's dark and it's seen some days, that's for sure. And now it lives at the haunted museum, rightfully so. Remember that viral video of Post Malone touching this random haunted artifact? That was this box, that was the same one. Now he's falling off stage and stuff. No, no idea what's going on with Post. Zach Baggins, please keep an eye on this box. Thank you so much. Hit that thumbs up for ghost proof glass. We really like that. It's the same glass they used in the movie 13 Ghosts. They just have that around the Dybbuk box. Matthew Lillard watches it the whole time. It's lovely. Number two, Pompeii eruption. Let's hope this one doesn't happen again, cause hot. Once a flourishing Roman city located near the Bay of Naples in Italy, that was, of course, until 79 AD when Mount Vesuvius decided, eh, I'm gonna explode. I'm gonna go off and bury the entire city and all its inhabitants under layers and layers of ash and pumice. How scary and horrible is that? The eruption was so powerful that it wiped out all life within a 16 mile radius. Yeah, it makes you think about Yellowstone National Park a bit, doesn't it? Earth is terrifying. She does some random shit. Pompeii remained buried and forgotten for almost 1700 years until it was rediscovered in 1748. Today, Pompeii Pompeii is, honestly, it's amazing. It's an archeological site that offers a glimpse into ancient Roman life with well-preserved ruins of homes, public buildings, streets, artwork, you name it. There's a restaurant that's open now. They reopened a restaurant they found buried. That's incredible. And there's also a great amount of people who steal from this ancient landmark because Humans are so stupid. Yeah, how to get cursed. This is how you do it. Listen up. Tourists would steal fragments of monuments, literally pieces of the city. They would pull out and then put it in their pocket. Yeah, put a little bit of Rome and take it home on our flight. And then put out my lovely fireplace there. That's great. A hundred packages a year will get sent back to the archeological superintendents, most of them being accompanied with a letter explaining all the bad luck that occurred after they took the piece. Yeah, don't take haunted pieces of Rome home with you. Don't take Rome home. That's what they should say. I'm gonna make a shirt and say, it's because they don't take Rome home. Everyone's like, what does that even mean? I'm like, ah, watch the video. I don't know, there's a QR code on the back, scan it. And finally, number one, James Dean's haunted car. James Dean's love for fast cars was well known, but sadly, because one of them was um, haunted. Apparently, let's talk about that one. One of these cars ultimately led to his tragic death at the age of 24, but some are now convinced that all of his cars were cursed in some way, shape, or form. There's a, a car curse, if you want to call it that. Dean's first vehicle was a Triumph Tiger T1 10 motorcycle. Now it was involved in an accident that left him with a broken leg, which where I'm about to go with things is not bad considering. His next car, a Porsche 550 Spider, is the one that he famously died in after colliding head on with another vehicle, much worse than a broken leg in my opinion. Now that's already tragic enough, that's dark history right there, could probably end the point. But after Dean's death, things happened. Afterwards, the Porsche was sold off and quickly became infamous for causing more accidents and more weird deaths. One of its owners even reported seeing the ghost of James Dean sitting in the passenger seat shortly before they crashed. That's really jarring. That's probably, that would make me crash. If I saw that beside me, I'd be like, okay, let's see you later. Now that car disappeared from public view in the late 1960s and has since been rumored to be hidden away by some collector who believes it to be cursed, so. Great, out of sight, out of mind. We love that. Another Porsche that James Dean owned was destroyed when it caught fire while being transported by a trailer. So two haunted cars. But a third Porsche that he'd ordered never made it to him because it was involved in an accident during transportation that killed that driver. So whether you believe in curses or not, there's no denying that James Dean's car collection has some dark, tragic history. Something's going on there, for sure. I don't have my license, and you know what? After that last point, I'm walking everywhere, that's it. I'm just speed walking everywhere with that big goofy belt. That's it, none of this, just this. That's so stupid. Number 10, Roman laundry detergent. So my washing machine broke this past week, which was a pain in the neck. Worst thing about it was that it broke in the middle of a load, so I had to wash the rest by hand, which made me glad we have washing machines at all. However, the Romans were a little more simplistic with their methods of cleansing the cloth. Apparently, vessels were set out in the streets of Rome for anyone to just walk up to and relieve themselves into. And and once full, they'd be taken down to the local laundromat. From there, workers would mix the vats with water and pour the combo onto their patrons' clothes, proceeding to stamp the clothes until clean. Yeah, sure, clean. Number nine. 
the fall of Drusus. In the case of historical poisonings, it's hard to determine whether or not they were actually poisoned or just died from being old. It's usually that they're old. But in the case of Drusus, the evidence was a little bit more clear. See, Drusus Julius Caesar was set to be the heir to Tiberius due to familial relations. His buddy Sejanus would have normally been the one to get the title, but blood is thicker than water. As a result, Sejanus tried to marry his daughter to Drusus' son, but that fell through. Sejanus was still determined to become the heir to Tiberius by whatever means necessary. This led to the two infighting frequently, and Sejanus eventually managed to seduce Drusus' wife, Lavilla, who aided him in poisoning her husband, slowly killing him in a way that appeared to be natural. And he got away with it. Sejanus continued to rise to power until his sudden and brutal execution, which was later revealed to be due to someone leaking the truth about his rise to Tiberius. Man, this just needs to be a telenovela. Number 8. Decimation You've likely heard the term before used to describe the impact of some tragedy or another. However, the word actually has its roots in the Roman military, though its origin is a little different from how you might imagine. See, as I'm sure you know, the Roman military was infamous for its discipline and strategy. But if you've ever worked in any space with more than 10 people, you know it's hard to keep everyone in line. So how did the Romans do it? Simple. If one squad member screws up, the entire unit gets the punishment. Decimation roughly translates to removal of a tenth. The cohort would be divvied up into ten groups, and each group would draw lots. The group with the shortest straws were then executed by the other nine by whatever method was determined by their commander. The nine of the surviving groups were then made to survive off barley, and if they had to relieve themselves, it would be outside of the camp security. You know what? Maybe the military life just ain't for me. Number 7. The Crassus Cocktail ah, I love a good drink at the end of the day. Just getting a little mix here and there, it's just so fun. Ooh, if it's good, man. Just caps off a hard day of work. It seems like Crassus was a man of similar taste. A general and a statesman who'd earned the title the richest man in Rome. Dude ran a bunch of wars, serious campaigns, and his last was against the Parthians. Primarily because he was just kind of bent out of shape that the other generals were outshining him in the field. Unfortunately, Crassus's forces were absolutely slaughtered, and when his son Publius ended up being one of the casualties of war, Crassus went to parley. Negotiations went sour, and he and his entire party were wiped out. Apparently, after such a rough day, the Parthians figured that Crassus could use a little something to take the edge off, so they had him take a sip of molten gold. Fun fact, the uh, melting point of gold is about 1064 degrees Celsius. Yeah, that'll have a kick. Number 6. The Fall of Emperor Valerian One of the later emperors of Rome, Valerian rose to power simply and ruled simply. Went to war a few times, killed a bunch of Christians, got beat up by Goths, basic Roman stuff. So when Valerian was captured by Cameo of Shapur I, it boggles the mind why they went as far as they did in making sure that this dude wasn't just defeated, they made sure his entire genetic code wouldn't survive the humiliation he received. First on the menu was for the Shapur to use him as a footstool while mounting their horses. He was then given the Crassus Special, a big old bowl of molten gold right down the gullet, which may or may not have happened while he was simultaneously being alive. His skin was then allegedly stuffed with straw and died, hung in the Persian temple for all to see. Seriously, the dude just didn't like Christians. Chill. In our number 5 spot today we have the hostage crisis. In 1980, America saw Ronald Reagan win the presidential election over former President Jimmy Carter, but there was a crisis going on that was taking the attention of Americans everywhere. The Iran hostage crisis is well known in American history, and it began on November 4th, 1970 when 52 American diplomats and citizens were held hostage by a group of militarized Iranian college students who took over the U.S. Embassy in Tehran. The 444 days these Americans were held hostage is something I'm sure a lot of Americans learned about at some point or another, but the release of the hostages is what sometimes gets a little murky in the history books. The hostages were released on January 20th, 1981, which was the day that Reagan was inaugurated. There were people who believed that the hostages were released because 
because Reagan was simply just more powerful than Jimmy Carter. Basically what I'm trying to say is that Reagan received a ton of credit for the release of the hostages, but truthfully, it barely had anything to do with him. The Carter administration had been attempting to negotiate with them for months, but they hated Carter because he had provided aid to the former monarch of Iran and had also failed an attempt to rescue the hostages before. So while they certainly were released on inauguration day, it had way less to do with Ronald Reagan and more to do with them just absolutely hating Jimmy Carter. In our number 4 spot today we have the zombie virus. I know The Walking Dead is a popular series, but none of us dream of living in that world. I mean, at least I hope not. What a literal nightmare. That is why in 2017, when the UK discovered that many of their caterpillars were falling victim to what became known as zombie virus, we all said we've had enough. Especially now that we've all gone through a pandemic. That kind of energy just needs to stay as far away from us as possible. The caterpillars were being infected with baculovirus, which stops their mold and encourages them to continue eating. Once they've eaten a bunch and they're full to the brim, the virus then tells them to head high onto a leaf, which like, if we weren't talking about a virus that's killing them, that would be like the cutest little sentence, just like, high on a little leaf. Anyway, it's not cute and it's sad. Basically, once on their leaf, if a bird doesn't snatch them up, warning, this is kind of gross, their body liquefies and explodes, and then the virus is spread onto the other caterpillars below. Yeah, see, let's all move on and forget it ever happened. Happened. The caterpillars are good, everyone's fine. In our number three spot today, we have the prohibition poisoning. I'm sure most of us learned about the prohibition at some point in school, which of course was the outlaw of the consumption of alcohol, which was done with a ban being placed on the production, importation, transportation, and sale of alcohol by the US government from 1920 to 1933. But it's just as well known that this ban certainly did not stop people from producing or consuming alcohol. It was just done in sneakier ways. The black market for alcohol was booming as people began to drink redistilled industrial alcohol instead. This is all pretty well known, but one super sketchy thing that is definitely less well known is something that government agencies did to curb the black market sales of alcohol. Basically, they poisoned the industrial alcohol that was being repurposed for drinking. And not just poisoned in a way where the drinker would get sick, which is already horrendous enough, but they poisoned the alcohol with lethal chemicals. It is thought that by the time the prohibition ended, at least 10,000 people died from this. This event is still one of the strangest and deadliest decisions made by government officials. In our number two spot today, we have the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire. New York City's Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire in 1911 was an unbelievable terrible incident that led to changes being made for factory workers in America. The Triangle Shirtwaist Factory was located on the 8th, 9th, and 10th floors of a building in Greenwich Village, and it of course was where shirtwaists were being made, which we would now call a woman's blouse. I call this place a factory, but it was definitely more like a sweatshop, and the employees were mostly comprised of young women. So like I mentioned before, in 1911 there was unfortunately a fire that broke out on the 8th floor, and because of the cramped and unsafe working conditions, the fire ended up claiming the lives of 146 people that day, which is just horrible. After more details came out about the incident and how terrible the working conditions were, protests broke out all around the city. People began demanding better for the women who had to work in these kinds of places. Like just as an example, the doors to the stairwells and exits were locked so that employees couldn't take unauthorized breaks. How unbelievable is that? And the worst part is that the owners of the company, who were largely responsible for what happened that day, basically basically just got off scot-free. In our number one spot today, we have internment camps. This is something that might be more well known than I think it is, but in my Canadian education, it wasn't something we talked about at all, which is kind of shocking. During World War II, President Franklin Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066, which would cause 117,000 Japanese Americans to have to give up their homes, jobs, and businesses and move to internment camps. This was due to the fear of espionage after Pearl Harbor. This was truly one of the worst violations of civil rights in the 20th century and the government didn't apologize for it until decades later, but they cited national security as the justification for their actions. Unfortunately, this was only the beginning as other countries began to follow suit with Canada, Mexico, Peru, Brazil, Chile, and Argentina all having their own versions of the same kind of atrocity. It is very surprising to me that this isn't something that is discussed more often, as it of course is something that would prove detrimental to the Japanese American community for decades to come. Number 10. 
The Doomsday Book, 1085. The Doomsday Book was created under William the First, also known as William the Conqueror. Like you're already the first man, you don't need two names, come on. This guy basically drew up a book to document people's money so that he could tax them. Oh yeah, this is the very first time surveyors went town to town and recorded how much money you would owe for simply just doing you. Men would show up at your house asking how much money you made and document your spending habits. Five shillings on groceries, huh? Okay. And five on that phone plan. Look, tax season's coming up, Arthur. It's not looking good, man. Talk about a bunch of crooks, huh? Imagine owing someone money for just trying to make an honest living. Yeah, thank God that didn't catch on, right guys? Oh, speaking of, I got a phone H&R block. Number nine, the Crusades. A three-part miniseries spanning over 200 years. These bloody and ruthless wars were battled between Muslim and Christians for the proprietorship over sacred sites and the land in the East Mediterranean. A three-part miniseries spanning over 200 years. These bloody and ruthless wars were battled between Muslim and Christians for proprietorship over sacred sites and land in the East Mediterranean. Wars that resulted in six million deaths. The Knights Templar, a brotherhood of highly trained soldiers horseback bashing their way through the east. These guys were the real deal, almost like the Navy SEALs of their time. We've seen these paintings, the elite fighting force with the red cross painted on their chests. I wonder if they had to do a hell week. These soldiers were the most trained and savage fighters in all the Christian armies. Richard I leading the third and final crusade, earning him the name Richard the Lionheart. Back then the names were always something so aggressive and scary. It was never like Richard the Clownfish or Henry the Pygmy Goat. No, 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 we need fear way more fear. Number eight, the Magna Carta. The year is 1215. We need some laws, people. This document was one of its kind. A document setting out the laws and limitations from the common man to King John himself. A legal system written down so that there are clear do's and don'ts. No free man shall be seized, imprisoned, dispossessed, outlawed, exiled, or ruined in any way, nor in any way proceeded against except by the lawful judgment of his peers. And the law of the land. Did you get all that? Right that down. Except women, they don't have laws. And they can't act in place. Sometimes people needed to face the music. And even animals. Huh? That's right, animals. Being tried. In a court. A lively and popular event trying any law-breaking animal from goats to pigs to even chickens. Ladies and gentlemen of the court, did you, Mr. Feathers, were peck the floor, yes or no? Objection, your honor, leading the witness. My brain can't fathom this, guys. Number seven, the Battle of Bannockburn. This infamous battle between Scotland and England was one of the most important battles of the Middle Ages. The end of the bloody war for independence. Basically, Scotland was like, yeah, we're gonna go over here and roll our R's. The gruesome wooden wars were caused by the English invading Scotland in 1296. A leader slowly rising the ranks, William Wallace, the guardian of the King of Scotland himself, holds off the English forces and is knighted a hero to Scotland. Unfortunately, like every hero back then, he was also hated. He was captured, hanged, drawn, and quartered. Like, why do you have to do all that after he dies? Like, he's dead. Not fun. The battles between Scotland and England ended in 1314 with Robert the Bruce securing Scotland's independence, adding like 45 more dialects to the UK. Freedom! Number six, the Black Death. Ooh, talk about a curveball. The year's 1348. People are saying things like, don't let the bed bugs bite. Clearly not a very clean and safe time. The Black Death, AKA pestilence, AKA the great mortality or simply known as the plague. Single-handedly the worst pandemic ever recorded in history, wiping out somewhere between 70 to 200 million people. Ooh, now I get where bless you comes from. Someone sneezed back then and everyone's dead at 14. This is where we see those doctors in the terrifying bird outfits with the long noses stuffed with garlic and herbs. Um, excuse me? Yeah, he's not wearing a mask. I'm just trying to watch a cat publicly get skinned. Yeah, six feet please. Some doctors prescribed urinating on a person so that the bad smell would drive out the infection. Can you imagine? Just a doctor writing you up a script and go ahead and pee on yourself about four to five times a day. Take with food should be gone early next week. And just let me put my mask back on here before you leave. There you are. The plague started in Europe in October 1347 when 12 ships from the Black Sea docked at the Sicilian port of Messina. Most sailors aboard the ships were already dead, but those who were still alive were covered head to toe in black boils that oozed pus and blood. Ugh. Sometimes the Black Death included fever, chills, vomiting, diarrhea, temporary loss in motor skills, and then of course, death. Number five is golden bling. Modern estimation says that South African gold mining was that of an epic 
epic scale. An estimated amount of gold ore mined from the entire region by the ancients exceeds 43 million tons. The ore yielded nearly 700 tons of pure gold, which today would be valued over $7.5 billion. Meanwhile, in West African gold mining, it's estimated 1,500 to 3,500 tons, worth more than 30 billion in today's market. So it comes as no surprise the African population used it like crazy. In 1324 AD, Malalian ruler Mansa Musa brought so much money with him to Egypt, his visit resulted in the collapse of gold prices and it took 12 years for their economy to bounce back. A 16th century traveler visited Central African civilization of Kanam Barno and commented that the emperor's cavalry had golden stirrups, spurs, bits and buckles. Even the ruler's dogs had chains of the finest gold. In 1067 AD, the emperor of Ghana was said to have an almost identical setup including a golden temple room. A Portuguese chronicler of 1600 AD Africa described the country's peoples as finely clad in many rich garments of gold, silk and cotton. And the women with much gold and silver chains and bracelets, which they wear on their legs, stomachs and arms and many jeweled earrings in their ears. Even the famous palace of Mount Fura is known for having gold chandeliers, outlines furniture, rafters, beams, decor pieces and cutlery also made of gold. It's easy to say that gold has a high cultural significance to the people of Africa's past and present presence, so always be conscious, do your research, and don't appropriate. Let's talk the Lost Nox, number four on the countdown, ah, tongue twister. The Nox are one of the most mysterious of ancient African civilizations. Located in what's now central Nigeria, the first evidence of their existence was actually an accidental discovery during a mining operation. The initial discovery kind of fell flat for some reason, but when a further trove of artifacts was unburied in 1928, archaeologists finally came rolling in. All we knew was that A, they were super ancient, and B, they made a ton of terracotta heads, like a lot. They're currently using these terracotta heads to date the time of the Nox existence, which is constantly being revised to be older and older and older. Currently, the assumption is the Nox culture may have been early 1500 BCE, being one of the earliest, if not the earliest, civilization in sub Sahara Africa. Wow. Nox developed smelting techniques which gave them iron tools much earlier than their neighbors that date back to 500 BCE. This technology leap meant that the Nox skipped over the Bronze Age entirely going from stone to iron. Incredible. Nock artifacts are spread over 50,000 square kilometers, inspiring archaeologists to believe in a potential mass Nock city sitting somewhere beneath or around, waiting to be discovered. Unfortunately, the reason we haven't yet is Nox used mud and wood to build their empire, something that the climactic conditions of Nigeria easily broke down over hundreds of years. Number three showcases the power and resilience of African women, the Igbo women's uprise. The colonists' first mistake was in taking power of Africa. Their second was in undermining it. The Igbo history, it's remembered as the Women's War, a massive revolt against the policies imposed by colonial British controlling Nigeria. In 1914, colonial governors implemented an indirect control and ruling system. Under his plan, they ruled locals using warrant chiefs who were traditionally the pre-existing Igbo chiefs. It became downright oppressive. Property was being stolen, draconian regulations implemented, go look up what I mean, and the imprisonment of those who spoke out against it. It was hard not to be mad at the warrant chiefs, but they were just the messenger. So what blew it out of the water was the colonialist imposed a special tax on the Igbo market women, people responsible for supplying food to the growing urban populations in varying Nigerian cities. Obviously, the population feared the taxes would drive many of the market women out of business and seriously disrupt the supply of food and non-perishable goods available to the populace. So November 1929, thousands of Igbo women congregate and protest warrant chief theft and tax at administration centers. They used a fun tradition dubbed sitting on a man, which is to censor men. They did this via all night song and dance ridicules. These icons also attacked colonial stores and banks, broke into prisons to release prisoners, and attacked the colonial monuments by burning them down. This two month siege had a reported 25 thousand Igbo women participants and in the end the Igbo women's action forced colonial authorities to drop their plans to impose a tax on the market women and curb the power of warrant chiefs. The women's uprising is seen as the first major challenge to British authority in Nigeria and West Africa during the colonial period and became a historical example of feminism and anti-colonial protest. Number two is another story of incredible perseverance, the Little George. You're quick to be taught in school about all the ships that made it to America with captured Africans and all the ones that sank with them. How about a story where the colonists were tossed overboard instead. Well, it happened once with the Little George in June 1730. This little known revolt was one of the most successful on sea uprisings of captured Africans in high sea history. It was five days into the voyage from the coast of Guinea to what's now Rhode Island, USA. There was a documented 
96 captured people aboard and held below in the poor ventilation, chained and piled amongst each other. Several of the captured men and women below began working tirelessly to free their wrists of shackles, unaccepting of this reality, so that on June 6, at 4 am, the captives were able to burst through the bulkhead of the ship. Unarmed, exhausted, dehydrated, it must have been adrenaline and the ancestors who aided them as they decimated the three watchmen who tried to alert the other crew. Using a homemade contraption of gunpowder and a glass bottle, other captives threatened to ignite it, something the rest of the crew would realize would blow a hole big enough to sink the ship. So the crew all surrendered. They doubted the Africans would be able, with no sailing or navigation experience, to use the ship and get back home and ultimately give up to them. No! These guys knew celestial mapping. They turned the ship around and sailed it back to the African continent, surviving off of the rations meant for the crew. It was their turn to starve anyway. After a few days, the little George reached the mouth of Sierra Leone River, where the Africans and British crew abandoned the ship, leaving the Captain George Scott aboard. Number one is Origin of Man. You're hearing it here first, maybe, but the human race is of African origin. Now, it's important to divide the line. I am not referring to Neanderthals, but rather the subset of human that followed and is what we are now. Referred to as Homo sapien sapien, remains found in Omo, Ethiopia are the oldest in the world, dating back to 230 plus thousand years old, and no older ones have yet to be found. They're titled Omo 1. The remains, they were originally thought to be from a later time period, using endless DNA testing and also the layering of volcanic ash, as well as debris over the remains through different periods, to help us determine a much older age just last year in 2022. A New York Times article published in March of 1979 documented this discovery on the front page when it first happened, under the title Nubian Monarchy Called the Oldest. As curious readers leafed through, they were able to learn that evidence of the oldest recognizable monarchy in human history, preceding the rise of the earliest Egyptian kings by several generations, has been discovered in artifacts from ancient Nubia. This area is now the territory of northern Sudan and southern modern day Egypt. This isn't a new theory or fact, however, as it's been long thought that we began in a single East or South African region, which eventually spread into Asia and then into Europe. But it is one left out of a lot of textbooks in school. Number 10, Animal Heaven. This was pretty odd and we're still talking about it, rightfully so. Coco the Gorilla, she was a famous primate known for her ability to communicate through sign language. We've all seen that video with her and Robin Williams tickling each other laughing. It's heartbreaking, it's beautiful. Gorillas are very smart and very strong, so strong. Francine Patterson, who was Coco's trainer and of course the closest human around to Coco, was asked in an interview how deep their conversations with Coco would actually go. The caregiver showed Coco a skeleton once and asked if it is alive or dead. Coco signed, dead, draped. Draped means covered up. Then they asked, where do animals go when they die? And then Coco said, apparently Coco said, a comfortable hole. And then she gave a kiss goodbye. Yeah, philosophical debates followed, of course, because what was she referring to here? Was Coco being referred to being put into the ground, literally? Or was she talking about an afterlife? A comfortable hole in the afterlife world? I don't know. Girls are so smart, and again, so strong. Number nine, Derek Amato. What started with tragedy ended in symphony. Here we go, I had no idea this was possible, and now I'm questioning everything. Derek Amato is a self-taught pianist who gained worldwide attention after a traumatic brain injury caused him to develop acquired Savin syndrome. Derek was diving into a shallow pool back in 2006. Now his concussion actually made him lose some of his hair and some of his memory, it was bad. But in a bizarre turn of events after the accident, Derek became musical genius. Guy was killer on the keys, who knew? This condition allowed him to access exceptional music abilities that were for sure not around before the accident. Amato actually released his own album titled Life in the Keys. That's incredible, I've tried so many times. Number eight, Katolan. A Mongol princess and descendant of Genghis Khan. Let's talk about her. Katolan is known in history for her undefeated wrestling abilities. If you can say that. She was said to have issued a challenge to any man who wanted to marry her, stating that the first must defeat her in a wrestling match. Now, despite many attempts by many, many men, Katolan reportedly remained undefeated, with some accounts suggesting she won as many as 10,000 matches. Yeah, tender, but make it exhausting, sure. Instead of a super swipe, she's giving you your legs swiped. I don't know. 
a super choke. Her story has become a legendary tale of strength and independence in Mongolian history. And also, how terrifying is that woman? Imagine being like number 6,000. You're like, I don't think I'm gonna do it. I don't think I'm gonna tap her out. I really have no clue. Uh, number seven, Hector. I'm not referring to the Greek hero Hector. No, not this time, not, not this time, Bumblebee. No, I'm referring to the cloud that was named after him. Yeah, we're talking about clouds now because eh, why not? Hector is a famous cloud formation that appears in the Tiwi Islands of Australia. Now the cloud appears from September to March every single year, every single day, which is terrifying. What's going on here? The area's unique weather patterns are quite the spectacle. The name Hector's Thunderstorm, or simply Hector, which I'm more fond of, that name also comes from a powerful storm that struck the area back in 1930s. A World War II pilot named it Hector, and that's how memorable it was. It's still going strong today. Yeah, today, even right now, I guess, yeah, Hector is still going. Tomorrow, Hector's gonna disappear. It's the last day to catch Hector. It's right now. Go get your last minute views on to Hector. That's crazy, I didn't realize that was today. At this point, he's a popular tourist attraction. Visitors can go and take boat tours to witness the spectacular lightning displays surrounding the storm. Me, personally, I want nothing to do with that. I watched Nope recently, so, no, this one freaked me out. I don't like clouds that show up on the regular. I don't know, clouds with a schedule, I'm all set. This next one here, kind of the same kind of thing. Here we go. Number six, medieval sky battle. This might happen soon, I don't know. Aliens, who knows? Short and sweet, this one. This looks like the inside of my old high school locker, first of all, but this is actually medieval art. This Nuremberg broadsheet shows us a battle, an Avengers level threat, really, if anything. This battle took place apparently on April 14th, 1561. It was an aerial battle involving, I don't know, globes, crosses, tubes, you tell me. I don't know what's going on in the sky, but Iron Man is nowhere to be found. These cigar-shaped UFOs have been breaking the internet recently, and I'm not gonna lie, they kind of look like what we're seeing in that medieval art. Maybe this is the same vehicle. Maybe it's the same battle. Maybe it's gonna happen again. People viewed this event as a divine warning. Yeah, obviously, you don't say. What else are you gonna call that? UFO is flying around. Someone's like, I have a bad feeling, Abraham. I don't know, this looks a little odd. Number five cat attacks. If I had to pick, I would of course say I'm 100% a dog person. I got, I'm sorry, I grew up with two cats, I'm allergic. I grew up with two dogs, not allergic. Dog guy all the way, sorry. Cats are cool, but this next story just totally freaked me out. Back in 1870, this rich woman had put her time, energy, and resources into cat breeding. How lovely is that? She had tons of cats, she loved all of them, and they loved her. Again, I'm allergic, so this, I'm already sneezing, just reading about this story. It was the 1800s, okay? A lot of candles, everything was obviously extremely flammable, and disaster hit often in Victorian times. And in 1870, a fire broke out at this young woman's home. The cats were trapped inside the house. Now, they made it outside, don't freak out or anything, they all made it out, but by the time the two maids had kicked the door open to rescue said cats, they had gone full primal. They were afraid, they were freaking out, they were just scratching their way out through anyone and everything. The fire in the house had obviously scared them, so when the doors were open, these two maids were both sadly attacked by all of these cats. What a horrible thank you for saving all of their lives. I pulled my cat's tail when I was younger. I learned real quick uh, never to do that ever again. Number four, hiccups. Today we have many cures for hiccups, yeah. You gotta get scared or hold your breath or drink water like while you're doing a handstand. I don't know, everyone's got weird ideas, whatever. But nothing was as dangerous as the Victorian era hiccup cure, yeah. Ready for this one, don't try it. This one's scarier than a jump scare, that's for sure. In 1899, again, in the good old Merck Medical Manual, it recommended using chloroform to cure your hiccups. Uh? Yeah, just completely damage your entire nervous system and poison your kidneys, for sure. To get rid of hiccups, that's way better. This 19th century anesthetic was not a solution. Never try this. Continue scaring your family and friends. That's definitely the way we handle hiccups now. Number three, tapeworms. Back in the Victorian times, they really figured out the trick to weight loss. Yeah, was it watching what you eat? Maybe counting your steps? Maybe getting a gym membership? Something like that? Nope, nope, and no way. No, it was way easier than all those things combined. Can you believe that? And you didn't even have to pull back on how much you were consuming. Doesn't this sound fascinating? What is this? Well, all you needed was a handy tapeworm. Yep, I don't have one. I don't know why I pointed. That'd be gross if I had one. Yeah, tapeworm. You know those things that can kill you today if you get one? See, the plan was if you eat a tapeworm egg, okay, it will later hatch in your stomach and at that point you could just eat anything you wanted because every time you ate, the tapeworm would also eat. So you could get your snack on while still rocking those Victorian skinny jeans, right? Tapeworm cis pills or go for a jog. 
your call. Number two, Victoria's reign. Queen Victoria's reign started in 1837 and it lasted until the Queen's death later on in 1901. At just age 18, Alexandrina Victoria had to rise up to the throne. She was born, of course, on May 24th, 1819. Queen Victoria was fifth in line when she was born, so right off the bat, it was actually highly unlikely that she would ever get the crown. Then one by one, out of nowhere, all of her family members began passing away suddenly. In four years, three of Victoria's cousins passed away, and then her father and grandfather both died a week apart from each other. So by the time 1830 rolled around, Victoria was only 11 years old and already she was next in line for the throne. That's how fast it happens. So as if that wasn't already stressful enough, Victoria was brought up under the Kensington system, which if you haven't heard of before, it's, it's pretty awful. Victoria's mother, Duchess Victoria of Kent, she created this Kensington system to control her daughter. She literally isolated the child from mates or family members, anything fun or social, you name it. Her mother did this to keep her Pure, of course, to keep her the most pure lady. This system sounds awful. Her mother would monitor her every action, including who she can see or speak to. Victoria only had two playmates growing up. That's it. I'm like, hey, me too. She had her half-sister, Princess Fedora of Lennington, and the Duchess attendant, Sir John Conroy, his daughter, Victoire. I mean, only three friends growing up, that's cruel. She shared a room with her mother until she was finally queen. Yeah, she couldn't walk down the hallway alone at any point. She had to always walk with her mother by her side, even to the washroom, that's crazy. Victoria has reflected on her childhood since, and yeah, she hates John Conroy for manipulating her mother, and she actually refers to him as Demon Incarnate, so. That's good, it's a nice nickname. Incarnate, incarnate. He's a demon, he's the worst. Let's just call him that. And finally, number one, royal enemies. Being the queen and all, a security team is of course needed at all times. And during her reign, there were multiple attempts to harm the young Queen Victoria. The first attack was back in 1840. It was a young guy named Edward Oxford and he attacked the queen's carriage. Just ran at it like a crazy guy. Obviously, and thankfully, nothing happened. But when Edward was later accused of high treason, he was actually found not guilty due to insanity. Then a couple years later, in 1842, it happened again, but this time it was two men attacking the carriage. And then in 1849, her carriage was attacked by William Hamilton. In 1850, as the carriage was passing the gates of Buckingham Palace, Robert Pate, a retired soldier, ran up and hit the carriage with his cane. He was going nuts as well. Everyone wants this carriage. This is like the ultimate, no one's getting through this carriage, apparently. Victoria was okay, luckily, but of course she was shook after all these events. Then again in 1842, 1849, 1872, attempt after attempt, it was horrifying. But then things got a little worse with a man named Boy Jones. Yeah, this guy stalked the queen from 1838 until 1841. This guy somehow managed to break into Buckingham Palace more than once. He knew a way in just to Buckingham Palace, which should never be a thing in the first place. And the weird part is here, Boy Jones, once he was inside the palace, he would hide under the queen's sofa. And he would also just sit on her throne for hours, just hanging out. Yeah, he would pretend he's Cersei Lannister and just sit on the throne for a minute or two. Think about life. Eventually, thankfully, he got caught, but Imagine coming home and Boyd Jones is sitting on your couch. You're like, what are you doing? Take that shirt off, get out of here. Starting our list off at number 10, Lake Neos. We love talking about Pompeii, we can't get enough of it. I'm fascinated. They have a restaurant that's back and open now in Pompeii, it's crazy. Now that's quite the eruption, historically, that's a bad one, that's pretty scary. But a recent eruption in 1986, well we don't talk about this one enough. First of all, a limnic eruption is a rare event, so you can sleep not in fear tonight. It occurs when CO2 dissolved in deep water lakes suddenly erupts. Cause uh, yeah, that can happen, who knew that? That's why I don't like lakes. There you go, right there. These events have only been observed twice, the deadliest being Lake Neos in 1986. When a limnic eruption occurs, large clouds of CO2 form, which then all of a sudden descend and drop below the oxygen in the air, causing all living things in the vicinity to choke and not survive anymore. In this case, the cloud fell on nearby villages, ultimately causing the deaths of 1,700 people and 3,500 livestock. Number nine, the Spanish flu of 1918. The Spanish flu of 1918. Okay, yeah, this one's probably pretty good. Since we know a little something about plagues now in real life and toilet paper and stress, let's turn the clocks back 95 years when the Spanish flu entered the game. What was it like back then? The Spanish flu, if you didn't know, it was a strain of the H1N1 virus, which we all know as well. And when it hit, it took 50 to 100 million people. 
very fast. 4% of the world's population gone. Now, it was recent and it was quite horrible. We couldn't stay home and watch Ozark for that one, so instead, the Spanish flu is said to have spread so violently because of soldiers being in close quarters during World War I. Yeah, again, very different than our plague. Immune systems were shot as is, and you're telling me a plague rolled through while we're in trenches? No way, what a nightmare. But just like that, the virus disappeared. Better treatment, perhaps it mutated into a much weaker strain. Either way, great, stay gone. Get out of here, go away and stay there, pal. Hit that thumbs up for the Spanish flu not being around. Awesome, we love that. It's a good one to not have. Number eight, the great dying. This name's pretty accurate, if I'm being honest with myself. Scariest environment imaginable, here we go. Turning the clocks and solar system back 252 million years ago, the Permian-Triassic extinction, which for convenience sake we'll call the great dying, was and hopefully shall remain the largest extinction event on Earth. The fact that we're even alive right now, watching this video, clicking that thumbs up and subscribing, well, it's all pretty rare, all things considered. This was a butterfly effect triggered by a massive volcanic eruption around the Serbian traps in Russia. A runaway greenhouse effect was responsible for the loss of 95% of all marine life and 70% of all land animals. That's so everything, pretty much. Pretty much everything's gone. Temperatures rose as the sea began to absorb large quantities of CO2 from the atmosphere. Mentioned that a little earlier, and that could not be great. And it began turning into carbonic acid, hence all that marine life that didn't make it. Methane hydrate then started to bubble from the ocean surface which is horrifying to imagine, and it raised the temperature even higher at that point. Now, imagine if this didn't happen. We'd have those scary sharks still swimming around. We're remnants of the surviving 4% of the great dying. Yeah, to all your friends that. I'm gonna add that to my LinkedIn. That sounds not half bad. Yeah, I survived the great dying, so yeah. Really good at scooping ice cream. Let's do it. Number seven, Maximilien Robespierre. On July 27th, 1794, French revolutionary Maximilien Robespierre and 21 of his followers were all arrested at the Hotel de Ville in Paris. Now, considering that this was 1794 and we got arrested, what follows is sure to be a public nightmare. The next day, Robespierre and again, 21 of his followers were all taken to the Palace de Revolution where they were all executed by guillotine before a cheering crowd. Always a cheering crowd, of course. What, are, what else are we doing today? Let's go watch. What history tends to leave out of this part is that Maximilian tempted to take his own life beforehand because he knew his fate was gonna suck with the whole you know, thing. But when he tried to take his own life, he survived and was left instead with a nasty jaw wound. So in Game of Thrones fashion, the executioner, when the time came, ripped the jaw bandage off first and then he saw the guillotine. Yeah, again, to a cheering crowd, remember? They all watch this, all this unfold. I can't even watch UFC sometimes. You're telling me people watch this? IRL? That's, I'm gonna go throw up real quick. Be right back. Number six. The eruption. Mount Pinatubo, which is located in the Philippines, was another volcanic eruption that shook up history. Little more recent than the other one. This was on June 15th, 1991. Mount Pinatubo, this massive volcano, erupted into what would be the second largest volcanic eruption of the 20th century. Impressive? Yes. Terrifying? Absolutely. Yep, yeah, this is very loud and scary. Activity in the volcano first started on April 2nd, 1991. And these things take a little time to, you know, finish up. So that same year, researchers set up seismographs in the area, and by June, the volcano was having a group of progressively shallower eruptions. And then on June 12th, the volcano had its first spectacular eruption, which sent hot ash 19 kilometers up into the atmosphere, which then rained on down to everything around it, which is the worst thing I can imagine. Additional smaller eruptions continued on June 13th, which then led to some intense seismic activity. And then, on June 15th, the volcano once again went off, this time sending a cloud of ash 40 kilometers into the atmosphere. So, bye bye sun for a little bit. This one's gonna linger. Number five, cheers. Located on the banks of the River Shannon in Athlone, Ireland, there's some taps that I hope have been cleaned over the past couple of years like thousands of years to be exact. Sean's bar has been serving drinks for as nearly as long as people have been drinking them. Along with claiming to be the oldest pub in Ireland, Sean's bar could be the oldest operating pub on the planet. In fact, in 2004, Guinness World Records issued a certificate to Sean's Bar as the oldest official pub in Ireland. The owner of Sean's Bar says that they found coins that dated to 900 AD, as well as the wattle and daub walls, which is an ancient building technique that mixed mud, wood, and clay together. Legend has it a man named Luan Mac Luachdic started the pub as a local guide to help travelers across the Shannon. 
Yeah. Eventually a small settlement built up around the crossing point and light eventually topped to a fully constructed pub. I'm pretty sure people couldn't say the name and just went with something way easier, you know what I mean? Right, are you going over to Sean McCollin McKean Mirhano Col de Mels for a pint after the game? No. Oh, it's Sean's bar now. Oh, that's much easier. Sean's. I'll meet you, Sean's. Number four, the gym twins. Back in 1979, a set of twins were reunited. They were 39 at the time. This was, of course, a big moment in their lives, obviously, because for 37 years, they barely knew of each other's existence. When they finally met, yeah, the long lost twins had a bit more in common than anybody ever thought. For starters, both had been named Jim, which is amazing. I spoiled that in the fun title. But their adoptive parents both named the lads Jim. That's crazy. And both Jims loved math and carpentry. Both also had jobs in security at the time of their reconnection, and their ex-wives were both named Linda. And they'd since married a woman both named Betty. I don't know, this is kind of too parallel university for me. Imagine meeting another you, and he's like, yeah, I love surfing and IMAX movies. What are the odds? Like, how specific is this? Are you kidding? No way, that's for sure an alien. He's a scroll. He's an imposter. Get him out. Number three. The Brown Sox. The Great Molasses Flood, aka the Boston Molasses Disaster, was an event that occurred January 1919 in the North End neighborhood of Boston, Massachusetts. Happy New Year, everybody. Time to get sticky. Yeah, apparently weather temperatures had risen in Boston at the time, and the mixture of cold and hot molasses together mixed due to the thermal expansion already inside the tank, eventually burst open and collapsed. Yeah, surf's up, dude. 2.3 million gallons of molasses, actually, weighing around 13,000 tons, and resulted in a wave of molasses about 25 feet high. Yeah, just rushing through the streets at an estimated 60 kilometers an hour. Sadly, killing around 21 people and injuring about 150. Yeah, yikes. The event entered local folklore, and residents claimed for decades afterwards that the area still smelled of molasses. Yeah, Boston Brown Sox. How did we miss that? That would've been great. White Sox, Red Sox, Brown Sox, no? It was reported in papers that, quote, everything that a Bostonian touched was sticky, you know? <laughs> hey, this brown goop, yeah, it's wicked sticky. Watch your feet. Number two, brand new bees. Yes, about time. A lot of us know bees is pretty harmless. They're fuzzy little pollinators. Unless, of course, you're allergic, then in that case, get out of here, just run, we got you. But bees normally do a lot more good than harm. That was, of course, until an experiment in the 70s went south and created an entirely new crossbred evil bee. Awesome, look out, I guess. This experiment was to take a regular honey bee and then breed it with a bee that's found in Africa that produces way more honey. And then, of course, the goal was to produce a manageable bee that would also provide more honey than a regular honey bee, right? Just better stuff. Well, the bees that came out were a lot less manageable, turns out, and they didn't even make more honey. Just, uh, just an F all the way down. Throw some Fs in the chat, boys. After this experiment ended, however, the bees got out into the environment, and then the 80s saw the beginning of some bee trouble. Yeah, they got out. Heads up, guys. New bees. Imagine that, being like, yeah, the bees got out. Yeah, they're new. We don't know. We don't know what they like to do. These bees are not only aggressive towards other kinds of bees, which, okay, relax, world star, that creates a huge problem, but they're also very aggressive towards humans. And when these bees sting you, their stinger stays with them. So they can, you know, keep Julius Caesaring you over and over instead of losing the, losing the shank. Victims of these swarms receive 10 times the amount of stings as a regular swarm. Awesome, and they react to disturbances 10 times as fast, and they'll also chase said disturbance a quarter of a mile, so hope you got your running shoes on today. These bees have actually caused at least a thousand deaths also, so yes, keep your heads up, they're definitely deadly. Number one, tree huggers. Gotta end on a nice one, you know what I mean? Just spent some time up north climbing, planting some trees myself this past weekend, but you know, the great tree. Yeah, can't really climb this one. The great banyan tree is located in Howrah, India. It's huge, like, Huge, huge, and beautiful. The entire garden is actually one individual tree that spans four acres and is over 80 feet tall, making it one of the natural marvels of the world. Why is this not a UNESCO World Heritage Site by now? It was planted by locals of unknown almost 300 years ago. That's nice. The old Great Banyan tree has roots that cover vast distances. Yeah, just for some numbers here, that's as wide and round as a Walmart. This thing is bigger than a Walmart. The canopy is all connected like the neural highway of a brain, connecting to each other in one giant labyrinth of root and leaf. Of course, the Sherman tree in California that was planted is the largest tree, but the humanity alone of this sacred tree humbles us in how small we are, how connected we could be, and the beauty of what a little bit of patience can do. That's nice, that's really nice. Kicking off the list at number 10, 
the first zoo. Long before the pyramids were even built, Egyptians were getting quite creative. They were the first to see a petting zoo. How brave is that, if anything? Yeah, let's just start touching animals and then see what happens. Let's do it. 6,000 years ago, Hierakonopolis was the capital of Upper Egypt during the pre-dynastic period. It was beautiful. It was sitting alongside the Nile River, which was even more beautiful back then, you can't even imagine. And in those days, perhaps the best way to flaunt your wealth was by getting an exotic pet. Yeah, the old Mike Tyson trick. There were excavations done back in the late 19th century by English archeologists James Quibble and Frederick Green, and they discovered that this town was once thriving with over 10,000 residents. It's a lot of people. It's a lot more people than we ever thought. That alone is amazing. That's a historical feat. But when further studies were performed, they also found the remains of an elephant surrounded in cosmetics, surrounded in ivory bracelets and amethyst beads, the whole glorious, you name it, a worshiped elephant. That's odd. Then they found the remains of cats and dogs, also worshipped. The dogs, slightly more worshipped. Common pets, some crocodiles. Again, brave owners there. There's also hippos, leopards, wild ox. It was a wild time. They were carefully buried, but the broken bones suggested a cruel history sometimes. But most of the times, they were pets. Not as bad as we thought there. I'm like, oh, ancient pets? No, they're good. A lot of ivory. Number nine. King Tut's passing. Perhaps one of the greatest mysteries is of course the history of the young King Tut. Younger than we remember, honestly. The young boy became pharaoh at just age nine in 1332 BC. Yeah, what were you doing at age nine? I was mini golfing, maybe, I don't even know. During his time ruling, the young king had to face a country in conflict. Egypt and Nubia at this point were going head to head over land, and not even 10 years into ruling, the young pharaoh passed away at age 18. It wasn't until 1922 until he was ever seen again. That's when Howard Carter, of course, discovered the tomb of the lost king, appropriately in the Valley of the Kings. This is where we could have been more careful, you know, historically, because when Tut was discovered, they tried to move his body out of the oil that coated the coffin. But in doing so, they got a little bit too excited. They didn't really know what they were doing back then, so they damaged him. Yeah, they damaged an ancient king. How brutal is that? So now it's next to impossible to tell what really took his life at such an early age, especially for a king. We have some ideas though. It's not entirely hopeless at this point. It was believed King Tut, after some 3D scans were done, had a broken leg. So he may have fallen off a chariot or something. So if King Tut passed at an early age out of nowhere, hopefully this was the reason why or else there's another mystery afoot. Number eight, the first peace treaty. The first peace treaty in history ever was back in 1259 BC. Now at this point, ancient Egyptians and the Hittite Empire were fighting over what's now modern day Syria. This conflict had been lasting for centuries. And finally, come 1274 BC, the Battle of Kadesh was now underway. Of course, there was tons of bloodshed, no clear victor in sight. So what's left to do at this point? For the first time ever, a peace treaty was agreed upon. Ramses II and King Hadassuli III both negotiated a peace treaty where both sides would aid each other if perhaps a third party decided to get involved. They saw their resources, they saw that they were lacking on both sides, so like, hey, we have no we have no shot, really. Let's just team up. A copy of the treaty can now be found in New York above the entrance to the United Nations Security Council chamber. It's also in the Guinness Book of World Records as the oldest peace treaty ever. That's how you know it's official, if you don't believe me. Every 90s kid watching right now is like, oh, really? Amen. That's a fact. That's a true fact right there. Those holographic covers. What a trip. Number seven, board games. I love board games a lot, even Monopoly. I have the patience for it every now and then. But ancient Egyptians, huh, talk about patience, my friends. They also loved board games. They created them. They got that board, kind of time. Dogs and Jackals, Mehen and Sinet, and 20 Squares, those are the classics. Mehen was played during the pre-dynastic period, around 2500 BC. Now the goal was to reach the center of the spiral, so we think we're trying to piece it together. The board was a coiled snake almost, pretty creative. Senate was the most popular game of all time. Queen and kings alike would play this one. Senate had a long board with 30 squares painted on it. Now of course the rules are still unknown, still heavily debated, just like Monopoly even today. But we have some ideas how Egyptians played it. Three of 10 squares, the last five are decorated, so it's assumed, like everything else in ancient Egypt, that this was themed on the afterlife. Plus, King Tut was buried with one of these boards. I'm gonna be buried with a GameCube or something like that. There's also some paintings of Queen Nefertiti playing Senate, so that's how you know it's a good one. It looks a lot like chess. Imagine playing a pharaoh in chess. God, I'd be so anxious. I'd be so nerve wracking. I wouldn't even play checkers with a pharaoh. That'd be too scary. I'm bad at checkers and chess. I don't know how to play chess. I'm lying to you guys. I've never played chess. I don't know how to. Number six, Akhenaten Moon. This queen was ruling during the 18th dynasty of Egypt. The pharaoh Akhenaten, well, this was his daughter. She followed in her father's footsteps and was a great ruler, but she was also the wife and half brother of one King Tut. A pretty conflicted spot to be in historically. Her and King Tut had the same father, but their mothers were different. Now after Tut's death, however, it's believed this queen may have married the pharaoh Ai shortly after, and perhaps she's buried near him right now in the Valley of 
the kings. Back in 2010, DNA testing was being done in tomb KB21, and there were two 18th dynasty queens that were recovered from that tomb in the Valley of the Kings. Could it be, perhaps? There wasn't enough data that was found from the mummy, but they do know that the DNA is somewhat of an 18th dynasty royal bloodline, so we're definitely close. In another tomb, tomb KB63, numerous coffins were found, and one had an imprint of a woman on it, along with jewelry, women's clothing at the time, but the biggest clue really at this point was pottery fragments. Of course, it's always in the pottery. We've all played Ogre enough time, always check the pots. The name Potten was on one of these pottery fragments. That's another clue. The only person to ever use this name historically was the long lost queen, of Akhenasunamun. So now we're getting real close. Dangerously close. But it feels weird to watch so many tombs be opened up at this point. Like, yeah, we're getting close to finding out things historically, but can we just leave these leading ladies alone? I feel like they dealt with enough men in their lifetime. Now we're just like, Boof. we're like, hey, is that her? Nope, we're good. It's like, eh. Let them rest. They have fake doors. They don't want us coming in. Number five, Abel and Baker. Okay, we often remember Laika the space dog and her 103 minute cosmic journey aboard Sputnik 2. But does anybody remember Abel and Baker? Why don't we talk about these two enough? This was the American version of Laika. This was less than two years right after that. It was May 28th, 1959. The United States launched two female primates. They launched Abel and Baker into space. This mission only lasted 15 minutes and they both safely returned back home. That's wild to me. The monkeys weren't injured from the cosmic commute at all. A radio message came in shortly right after they splashed down in the Atlantic and the message said, no injuries or other difficulties. Thank the Lord, we love that. Abel and Baker, perfect, as they said. I don't think we can blast any more primates into space going 10,000 miles an hour anymore, but it's wild to me that we did this ever. This is insane. A human had to strap in a chimp into a rocket ship and be like, all right, see ya, and then, that's insane. Grown adults had to do that. That's insane. Abel sadly passed away shortly after the flight. Nothing to do with the actual flight itself, just timing. Meanwhile, Baker, she got famous. She was getting 150 fan letters a day. Imagine if she had Twitter. Oh, be wild. These ladies are icons. Never mind Laika, okay? Hit that thumbs up for Abel and then subscribe for Baker. They went in space, that's crazy. Number four, asteroid redirection. Speaking of space, this one has Michael Bay written all over it, I can't wait. I'm pretty excited for this project. I can't even catch a baseball with my hands. You're telling me NASA is gonna catch an asteroid hurling through space? This is the future, we've arrived. NASA landing on an asteroid is one thing, sure that's, you know, a Michael Bay movie, but their asteroid redirection mission, that's a whole nother level. This coming Monday, as in like four days from now, I don't know, NASA is gonna broadcast its first attempt to modify the orbit of an asteroid hurling through space. This is real life. And before you start to panic, no, there's no way any debris can hit the Earth after said test. But if an asteroid was coming for Earth, well, now we have a backup plan to hopefully, ideally, save the human race and the planet. That would be helpful. That's always handy. The planetary defense team is using a craft called DART, just sending a, sending a DART out there. You got a dart? Awesome. Double asteroid redirection test, dart, which will ideally target the asteroid Dimorphos and then altering its orbit. And we can tune in live to watch the whole thing on Monday, because that's where we're at in the future. We can just tune in live and watch Jake Paul fight someone or watch an asteroid get blasted off of its course. How are you spending your afternoon? this Monday. Number three, mass extinctions. Are we part of the sixth extinction? I mean, we're talking about asteroids getting blasted away from Earth. It kind of feels like it. It kind of feels like something's nearing us. It's happening right now, isn't it? We lose thousands of species every year. And when looking in the past, sure, asteroids and ice ages, they've all caused these massive extinction level events, of course. But after humans invented the wheel and discovered fire and, you know, became the worst things ever to exist, things started to change naturally. In the 1800s, industrialization drove up extinction rates and continues to do so, obviously. We're not helping the planet by any means. And according to Elizabeth Colbert, across the world, scientists every day are monitoring what could be the largest extinction event since the dinosaurs. Right now, it's happening right now. The way human beings interact with the environment and affect biodiversity, it could be more deadly than an asteroid hitting the Earth. That's a, that's a fun, scary fact, okay. With an ever climbing list of endangered species, Colbert and the world ask the question, is it too late to change it? Kind of feels like it's too late. Okay, let's move on to something a little more lighter so we don't feel like complete trash. Deal? Deal. Number two, re-laxative. Okay, so right off the bat, the Victorian era was a little messy. I'm sure you've figured this out by now, but these messy illnesses were putting a lot of pressure on medical practitioners back in the Victorian day, so they were desperate for new 
treatments. Sometimes I laugh at Victorian medical treatments, but they tried. And they also achieved many medical breakthroughs, one that I saved for number one. But when it came to handling chicken pox in the Victorian era, that wasn't our finest hour. No, we didn't figure that one out, I don't think, right off the bat. Chicken pox in the Victorian era was being treated by using laxatives. Yeah, just let that sink in for a second. I have chicken pox. What should I do, doc? Eh, just go take a sh or six. I don't know, it might help. Yeah, folks would slam some castor oil and then, ready for this? They would get even more sick. Yeah, who would have thought, right? You thought you were uncomfortable before. Well, <laughs> not even close. Not every answer was a solution in the Victorian era. But this one was. And finally, number one, the discovery of penicillin. Thank God this one happened. This was, we'll still talk about this one because it's a really good one. Sometimes miracles happen when nobody is in the room or no one's looking. That's ideally the best time. Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin back in 1928. Now at the time, he was actually studying Staphylococcus, which is bacteria that causes infections and boils and all that nasty stuff. But right before Alexander left for a well-earned two-week vacation, he left a petri dish with some of that Staphylococcus right there on the table, just sitting there. Rather than, you know, store it away in an incubator, he just accidentally left it out. Now during this time off, a penicillium mold, the spore just drifted in there, either through a window or up the lab stairwell, some Horton here's a who type commute. It drifted in there and the temperatures of the room and the lack of one Alexander Fleming allowed for the mold to fight back. And then miracles literally happened. It then prevented that bacteria from growing anymore. So he returned and discovered this antibacterial substance was only produced by strains of penicillium. So now we have a solution that isn't a laxative. You know what I mean? Now we have some things that help us out medicinally. Yeah, we got asteroids, some medicines, some, some horrible history, some dark, Dark, tragic events, we got it all in this list, really. I don't know how to tell you that. Number 10, Desimviri, the law of 12 tables. Well, actually the word means 10. 10 men, actually. Those special 10 would be the appointed men who would consider themselves the first ever lawmakers. The earliest attempts to create a code of law was the law of 12 tables. A commission of 10 men are also known as the Desimviri, was appointed 455 BC to draw up a code of law binding rules on both patrician and plebeian, which would be strictly enforced. Some of these laws included simple laws like, you don't break your word. If the army or king calls on you, you gotta go. And of course, if you hit or hurt someone, you get hit or hurt back. And you owe us some money. This system was the first in its place, holding people responsible for the things that they did and said in Rome. Strategic, fundamental, and important laws like, hey, 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 no crying at funerals, all right? You burn my corn, I'm gonna burn your corn, and I get to burn you. And yeah, no meetings at night. It, it's dark. Okay, so they missed their mark on a couple of them, but a couple of those laws still stuck around. Number nine, field surgery. The Romans were fierce on the battlefield, but they were also extremely handy. Who would have thought? This was the first time in history where quick surgeries were performed on the battlefield under the leadership of Augustus. Not Augustus Mayhew, it's a different Augustus, but he's also really helpful, like one time a year. Ancient Roman medics invented hemostatic tourniquets and surgical clamps. Yeah, guy invented clamps. Imagine that on a resume. Roman field doctors would also perform physicals on new warriors. Yeah, they would also combat the spread of disease. Although they were going to war and were constantly being patched up, the Roman military would often live longer than the average folk because these military men were constantly being disinfected. They were checking their camps all day. Masks are hard in 2020, but the Romans were disinfecting the Colosseum. Nice, we'll get there one day. Maybe, maybe. Number eight, the name Rome. We kind of got into this a little bit about those brothers Ramus and Romulus. This barbaric history is loose and from many sources, so I'm gonna kind of sum it up into broad statements. Two brothers, didn't like each other, kept fighting, raised by a wolf and a bird. That's pretty much it. We have seen what these two have looked like. Every statue and painting of these two is always like one of them stone cold Steve Austining the other one. One built a wall and the other mocked him and jumped over that wall and then there is only one. I feel like I made a sandcastle once and Taylor stepped on it and I can absolutely see how the city was formed. Flawless victory. Yeah, that sounds like brotherly love to me. Rome deriving from its name Romulus, the victor in this legendary sibling quarrel, giving the city its official name. Hey. You got the god of war as your dad, and the mother of all gods and goddesses as your mom, there's gonna be some feeling of purpose just lingering around. Just like you just like make a wall. 
And with a couple drywall holes later, with the death and defeat of his brother Ramus, Romulus claimed his position as king and named the city after himself. Selfish much. Ugh, he ain't heavy, baby. He's my brother. Number seven, daily acts. In a time before Twitter or Facebook, how else do we get our fake news, right? How do we share our ants nonsense? How do we do it? 131 BC, this marked the first time a newspaper was ever used. Well, they're referred to as daily acts at this point, or acta diurna. The saying, written in stone, couldn't have been more historically accurate in this case. See, these texts containing information on military or civil issues, death notices, gladiatorial events, you name it, these were commonly written on metal or stone. Your morning news etched into a stone. Imagine the crossword section in 131 BC. Hey honey, who's the neighbor in Simpsons? Flanders, nice, that's it. Ping, ping, is that an F? Ping. It took time and effort, it was exhausting just to get one notice out to the public. So you best take these notes seriously, okay? Imagine YouTube comments written in stone. It took a guy six business days to write it, so he meant it. Number six, Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar was a Roman general and statesman, a member of the first triumvirate, Caesar led the Roman armies in the Gallic Wars, which, well, we've seen and heard about these battles that Julius Caesar led. It's the organized outfit of shiny metal and red, moving slowly and swiftly through the Gauls like a man-made tank before defeating his political rival, Pompey the Great, another military leader, and also the husband of Caesar's daughter, Julia. Okay, there it is, yeah. That's why he became his nemesis. Political differences, yeah. Due to these ongoing internal civil wars between the two leaders, Julius Caesar eventually killed Pompey in battle and became dictator of Rome. This was until his assassination in 44 BC. Oh, mighty Caesar, dost thou lie so low? Are all thy conquests, glories, triumphs, spoils shrunk to this little measure? Ah, fare thee well. Antony, Act 3, Scene 1. Hey man, eye for an eye. You read the rules. He played a crucial role in the events that led to the Roman Empire and remains one of the brightest and bravest military leaders the world has ever seen. His story can be seen and heard top to tail in William Shakespeare's play simply titled Julius Caesar. Number five, no birds at the funeral. If you ever want to liven up a funeral, try bringing a parrot. They'd love to heckle, turns out. Former President Andrew Jackson, he passed away a long time ago. He passed away in 1845. Now, it's important to note that he passed away before his pet did. He passed away before his pet parrot died. So the parrot, of course, attended the funeral, right? How lovely, right? I bet after I said that, you said, oh, maybe you give it a thumbs up, maybe you subscribed. Good stuff going around, right? It's lovely. Thing is, the parrot loved to swear. Yeah, you had a few curse words in his back pocket. This parrot actually heckled so much during the funeral that they had to remove it. How epic is that? It got kicked out like it was a comedy club. They're like, all right, put your wings behind your little bird neck. We're out of here. Number four, illegal pedestrian crossing. I see this far too often living in the city. Toronto is wild for this. It drives me crazy. People jaywalking. Looks like there's not a truck coming your way. They do that little wave, a little smile, a little weird walk, and they just go wherever they want. Middle of a Toronto intersection. They're like, hey, I'm 92. See ya. Everyone's slamming their brakes, avoiding them all of a sudden. You're holding up traffic even more. Now, in China, jaywalking, that's a no-go. Article 40 of Beijing's traffic law stipulates that drivers and motor vehicles cannot suddenly stop even if it's at a crosswalk. So yeah, you can't even stop when you're at a crosswalk. You have to wait for cars. So if you're not in a car, you have to wait. You don't get the right of way automatically, like, you know, most of the time. And for drivers, it's forbidden to stop at these crossings. You gotta just keep going. If you do, you're getting a fine. Hopefully just a warning, but possibly a fine for stopping at a crosswalk. How insane is that? Number three, raining coffee. The sky is falling. Sometimes it's frozen lizards and sometimes it's bugs. But you know what? Sometimes maybe coffee will fall from the sky. I don't know. Get your mugs ready. We're waking up early tomorrow. I don't know. Back in 1969, a South Carolina factory was busy. The non-dairy creamer, Cremora, was doing great production-wise, but they didn't have the greatest air vents in the factory. All of a sudden, the powder mixture leaked out one day, went into the air, where it then mixed with falling rain, and voila. Now we have double-doubles falling from the clouds. Now we have a really odd rainfall. Chester, South Carolina. It was the day we woke up to coffee goop on our lawns instead of dew. That's memorable for sure. The company ended up paying a fine of $4,000 for allowing their product to be released from the plant. 
Could have been worse, could have been a lot worse. Could have been a spider factory, I don't know. First thing I can think of. Number two, it can't stop all of us. Remember that Area 51 raid that went down back in 2019? Months of planning, gathering heads, planning trips, renting cars, all to get everyone out to Nevada. Everyone was determined to find out the truth about aliens. It was a big raid where everyone planned to overthrow every Area 51 guard. So, did it work? What ended up happening there? I forget. Everyone! We're not here for photos! We're here to rescue the aliens! Rescue! Yeah, okay, didn't work. Turns out a handful of gamers can't overthrow a government military base. Who knew? Shoot, maybe next time, I don't know. So what was the goal here? 1.5 million people signed up to storm Area 51 in 2019, but this wasn't the first time something like this happened. Back in the 1950s, the public also wanted answers. It was June 17th, 1959, and the Rizzo Evening Gazette published a story with the headline reading, more flying objects seen in Clark Sky. That's pretty alarming. Then the paper went on to describe how Sergeant Wayne Anderson, a local sheriff, was one of many who spotted what the paper described as an object, bright green and color and descending towards the earth at a speed too great to be an airplane. Yeah, I just watched Jordan Peele's and no, couldn't have done this list at a better time if you ask me. What did they see? It was green, it was close, was it Optimus Prime just coming to say what's up? I need answers, folks. And finally, number one, tombstones ashore. Here we go, death is calling. Back in 2012, the world thankfully did not end, but if you believed that it was going to, this definitely would have freaked you out. Back in May 2012, two friends were on a nice beach walk right on the coast of San Francisco's Ocean Beach. Now, when all of a sudden, something that looked like a fridge started to crash through the waves and then onto the shore. Now, it turns out it was not a fridge. That would have been lovely. It would have been a nice surprise. Just some fridge goods popping out from 1976. It turns out it was a massive tombstone from the year 1876. It was a little more haunting than a fridge. The tomb originally belonged to Emma Bosworth, and then just one month later, another stone was found, this time with a different name. Of course, that'd be weird if it was the same name again. And then another one, and then another one. So what's going on here? The next tombstone belonged to Delia Presby Oliver from 1890. But the condition that they were in also, these tombstones, they looked brand new. You probably expect as I'm describing this that they're all old and broken apart. Nope. They're all pristine, even more haunting almost. I don't know. These tombstones came from the Laurel Hill Cemetery after it had shut its gates in 1940. So the headstones were then used as a makeshift seawall. If you ask me, that's a little rude. Your uncle's tombstone just covered in barnacles like he's Davy Jones? No thanks, pop that out, put that back, draw that out. In our number 10 spot today, we have lobotomies. Did you know that it used to be common practice for people to just get a part of their brain cut out? Okay, well maybe not common, but it wasn't as uncommon as you would hope. Lobotomies used to be considered an excellent and efficient cure for things such as mental health problems, which thankfully is a practice that has not survived for a very good reason. Of course, in modern medicine, lobotomies still exist, but only when actually necessary. And there is of course a lot more knowledge about the dangers and effects. One well-known person to have undergone one of these procedures was Rosemary Kennedy, who was John F. Kennedy's sister. She was experiencing seizures as well as mood swings and while these seizures certainly were something that needed to be looked after for her health, I'm not sure if the mood swings necessarily needed some kind of medical intervention. Anyways, to quote unquote cure her, they had a lobotomy performed on her. This procedure left her with the mental capacity of a two-year-old, and she could no longer speak or walk properly. After this, she spent most of her life hidden away, and it was thought that her family did this because they were ashamed of her, which is both horrible and so sad. In our number nine spot today, we have the posthumous execution. Okay, so this is something that has actually happened more than once, but I just found out it's happened at all, and I'm both slightly confused and absolutely disgusted at the idea, so I needed to share one example with you guys. So there was a man named Oliver Cromwell, who Wikipedia describes as, quote, an English general and statesman who, first as a subordinate and later as commander in chief, led armies of the Parliament of England against King Charles the first during the English Civil War, subsequently ruling British Isles as Lord Protector from 1653 until his death in 1658. So, in 1658, Oliver passed away fairly suddenly, and his son Richard became Lord Protector, but because he now had a power base in Parliament or the Army, he had to resign just the following year, which effectively ended the Protectorate. Since there was no clear leadership during this time, George Monk was able to have the Long Parliament restored. He then made some slight constitutional 
constitutional adjustments so that Charles II could be invited back from exile in 1660 and actually be a king under a restored monarchy. So then on January 30th, 1661, on what was the 12th anniversary of the execution of King Charles I, Oliver's body was exhumed and executed posthumously. They killed a dead guy. I get that it's like symbolic, but it's just like a little redundant, don't we think? Anyway, his head was cut off and displayed outside of Westminster Hall until 1685. Afterwards, it had a series of different owners, which only adds to the oddity of the story. In our number eight spot today, we have Angel. Agent Orange. Agent Orange is not Cody Banks' cousin, but it was an extremely potent herbicide used from 1961 to 1971 in the Vietnam War. It was intended to cut through the canopy of thick foliage in Vietnam in order to reveal the troops underneath, but instead it proved to be extremely deadly to humans. It caused cancers, birth defects, and so many more different health issues. It's not like it was just a little bit either. 21 million gallons of it were sprayed over Vietnam, which affected hundreds of thousands of Vietnamese citizens, and it also affected the US veterans who faced exposure as well. While this is a dark part of history and it's really difficult to hear about, it's also important that we don't forget things like this. Knowing our history is so important so we don't make the same mistakes again. In our number seven spot today, we we have the Red Summer. The Red Summer is something I didn't even hear mentioned in school, which is honestly absolutely shocking. I'm hoping this is something that is more commonly taught than I think it is, because it really is important. The Red Summer is the term used to refer to the period from the late winter through to the early autumn of 1919, in which white supremacist terrorism and racial riots took place in more than three dozen cities across America. Some of the more well-known race riots that took place during the Red Summer were the Chicago Washington DC riots. These anti-black riots are said to have developed from a multitude of post-World War I tensions, such as the economic slump and the competition in job and housing markets. In 1919, it certainly wasn't uncommon for there to be race riots and a multitude of white on black violence, but the Red Summer really marked some of the first race riots in which black people in number stood up to the white supremacy, resisted, and fought back. During the Red Summer, a civil rights activist named A. Philip Rand Randolph publicly defended the right of black people to self-defense. It is said that between January 1st and September 14th of 1919, white mobs left at least 43 black Americans, but despite this, the states refused to interfere or prosecute these mobs. Considering how many race riots went on during this summer, we truly could dedicate an entire video to the Red Summer. It is insane to think about how recent 1919 really was, and while we certainly have come a long way, there's always more work to be done and part of the work involves us learning about these horrible histories and what has happened in our past. In our number six spot today, we have King Gojian of Yu. King Gojian of Yu had his reign from 496 BC until 465 BC. His reign took place during what was arguably the last major conflict of the spring and autumn period, and he was able to lead his state to victory, but it certainly wasn't an easy road or without some very creepy happenings. The major conflict he led his state through was the war between Wu and Yu, which started when a Yu princess, who was married to a prince of Wu, left her husband and fled back to Yu. I mean, this of course wasn't the only thing that caused the war, but it certainly sparked the fire. The king was an extremely humble king, as he wouldn't relish in the riches he had, as most royals would. Instead, he ate the same food as peasants and often would leave himself hungry in order to remember that he was in a position to serve his state. Okay, so you might be sitting there wondering when I'm going to get to the scary historical event you came to this video for, so here it is. As I mentioned before, he was able to lead his state to victory, but of course a war involves a lot of sacrifice and some pretty horrific happenings. The king's army was very well known for their ability to scare their enemies before a battle began, and this is because their front line consisted of criminals who had been sentenced to death. In this time, there wasn't lethal injection or the electric chair, so naturally, it was a lot more of a vicious process. These criminals would decapitate themselves in front of the enemy army. Yep, I think this is probably the definition of a scary historical event. I can't even imagine witnessing something like that and then having to proceed with a battle against the army that has people doing that sort of thing. The king was certainly not a leader who wasted any time messing around. For number five, we're getting a little spicy with risque's men's clothing. Now, you may have already heard stories or seen memes about ridiculously long pointed shoes and groin flattering armor, but did you know that provocative men Men's clothing was 
all the rage for a period of time in the medieval era. It's recorded that in the late 14th century, men were quite keen to be seen in overtly short tunics and thin tights. By 1463, a modesty statute had to be passed as men had upgraded to wearing cod pieces publicly, which did cover their mostly exposed genitals, but only by making them look cartoonishly large and bulbous in the process. A similar escapade happened with the Krakow shoe. These long, pointy-ended shoes were sometimes so long that they had to be tied back around the wearer's ankles or reinforced inside with a whalebone. The same statute in 1463 also addressed limiting these Krakow shoes for those reasons. Seems like there may be a little bit of a compensation theme here. Both provocative dressing and shoe length were limited to those of extreme wealth after the statute passed, but that didn't stop the development of some more outlandish beauty standards. For example, number four in our countdown is Plucked Bear. Nowadays, whether you're scrolling through an app or walking down the road, you're likely to see advertisements for eyelashes and hair accentuation services. And while that may be pretty trendy and normal to us, now, in the medieval ages, having hair on your face would have actually made you stand out in a crowd. Women would remove their eyebrows, eyelashes, even significantly reduce their hairline so as to achieve a smooth egg-like effect. This was because the forehead was considered the center point of the face for many years, and so it would make sense to remove anything on or around it so as to accentuate it, right? Maybe. Moving on. If you're tired of her plucking herself bald, and she's tired of you wearing shoes that enter a room before you do, then maybe it's time for a good old fashioned medieval divorce by combat. That's right, you heard me. Coming in at number three is divorce by combat. This finding was discovered in historic German manuscript that laid out rules as to how divorce by combat was to proceed. Their decision to use combat as a means to solution was not unusual for medieval Germany, as trial by combat was part of their law system. Trial by combat was legally sanctioned duel that ensured whomever was to win the fight was deemed Right. There are many ways that these duels could be fought and various weapons and locations in which to have them. The divorce by combat trial was placed when a man was put into a three foot deep hole with one hand tied behind his back. The woman, however, would have a normal ground and be able to move freely. This was believed to ensure a fair fight between the sexes. Now there is some evidence that the outcome of these trials could still end in death even if the death was not as a result of the combat. It's said that if the man lost to his wife, he would be taken from his hole and executed in the town square. If the woman lost, she would be then placed in the hole and then buried alive. So yeah, I'd say maybe try talking it out a little bit first before resorting to a public throwdown that can end in death. And while we're on the topic of trials, number two on the countdown is trials of the dead. Who would have such a vendetta with the dead that they would have them unburied to stand a trial? Well, new Pope Stephen, that's who. In 897, the months old body of Pope Fomorpheus, the first Pope to ever be executed, was extracted from his grave to serve trial for his alleged usurping of papacy. The new Pope donned the corpse in elaborate robes and even assigned a deacon for defense. You may be wondering why the new Pope Pope Stephen had done this to his predecessor. Since a holy person's body was considered to become a holy relic in death, it became a holy right to display their corpse in public tombs or churches so petitioners may still visit their former saint to leave tokens or deliver prayer. What better way to ensure that you have devoted attention of the community than a postpartum smear campaign where your opponent can't defend themselves because, well, they're dead. Stephen found the deceased Pope from Morpheus guilty so that he could toss his body into the Tiber River, as nobody can venerate his relic if his body is lost at sea. That's a pretty intense way to upsurp the person who had the job before you. Jokes on Stephen, however, as shortly after this trial, he was executed just like his predecessor, making him once again come in second to Fomorpheus. Call it karma. With that dose of crazy, we can move on to medieval madness, which ranks at number one in our countdown. What was the medieval madness? Well, if you're a fan of rye bread, you may not want to listen in on this. In an era without refrigeration systems as well as poor hygiene, produce was left to natural elements. As a result, mold and bacteria growth was common and would of course migrate into food. Ergot mold is the most well known for its effect on the brain. It caused wild hallucinations and extreme emotional changes as the chemicals in your brain became imbalanced. The consumption of this mold and bacteria has had a variety of exclusively unpleasant side effects, such as vomiting, diarrhea, convulsions, delayed visions, even major
mania and psychosis. These symptoms make it obvious as to why this could be labeled as a madness. The extreme cases of ergot consumption would of course lead to things such as loss of limb, gangrene or death. And this connection between molding rye flour and ergot poisoning wouldn't be made until 1670. So for hundreds of years beforehand, commoners saw ergot poisoning to be things like demonic possession. Many theorize and connect the medieval madness to that of the time periods of the witch trials. The trials began in 1691, a year of intensive wet and cold which produces a higher level of ergot. They ended abruptly in 1693, a year said to be sparse on rye grain. If there's less to consume, there's less ability to be poisoned. Making it arguable that there could be a connection between the two, especially as a side effect of ergot poisoning could be mistaken as demonic possession as previously mentioned. And that is also seen as a symptom of witchcraft. Still, this may not be the kind of bread you want to chase. Number 10, design capital of the world. This is more recent history for you as in 2014, Cape Town became not only South Africa, but Africa itself, first ever city to be designated the renowned title of world design capital. When a bid for the WDC designation, South African officials recognized that they faced many challenges that could benefit from design as a problem solving tool. Through its theme, live design, transform lives, they sought to establish a legacy that would enable the city to make better, smarter decisions to ultimately improve the everyday lives of its citizens. These included examples of public and private collaborations and innovations, urban planning and renewal, sustainable solutions for housing, agriculture, energy and climate change, public sector responses to urbanization, and community building with social cohesion within struggling cities. This designation increases tourism and funding, and also boosts advertisement for travel in other countries. By using design as a tool for citizen engagement in 40 co-designed workshops covering 80 of the 111 wards of Cape Town, they took design inspiration for public art, park spaces, and local business districts. A total of 2,051 people participated in the workshops, meaning African citizens got to be hands-on with planning and see the execution of their community work together. We should take some inspiration from that here in North America. If the lion doesn't get you, they definitely will. Number nine is the black mambas. Animal poaching is a huge issue in Africa as wealthy tourists ignore animal protection laws and their own safety and troop forward with heads full of blatant ignorance to kill endangered species such as rhinos, elephants, and more. Anti-poaching expeditions aren't new as a result. These groups go out and find poachers who are both locals and tourists alike to arrest and charge them before they do any harm. So meet the black mamba. Rough and tough, what makes them unique is they are an all women's ranger unit protecting the Balul Nature Reserve at South Africa. While park visitors are relaxing at Balul's many tourist attractions, the mambas are working hard in the background. They collect bush meat snares, monitor camera traps, and keep watch for evidence of illegal activities such as poisoning or bush meat kitchens. Alongside their patrols, the mambas run Bush Baby Environmental Education Program, which offers local school children weekly lessons about wildlife and conservation. It's all part of their plan to make poaching a thing of the past through education, inspiration, and food security. Before the Black Mambas were founded in 2013, poachers would enter the reserve regularly. We've reduced that by 89% and we've received awards from conservation organizations in South Africa, the USA, and China, says Sergeant Kud Moholongo. Number eight is the creation of Kaun City. This ancient Egyptian city built in 1895 BC is said to be the world's first ever planned city rather than a group of inhabitants settling down and more joining the habitation or being birthed into it over time, which is usually the cause of unplanned expansion. No, Kaun City was different. Rectangular and walled, the city was divided into two parts. One part housed the wealthier inhabitants, such as scribes, officials, and foremen. The other part housed ordinary civilians, necessary for the economy. The streets of the western section, in particular, were straight, laid out on a grid, and crossed each other at right angles. A stone gutter over a half meter wide ran down the center of every street, as functional sewers and restrooms, as you'll learn, were mastered by ancient African people. This is a unique thing to have claim over. Not the not the toilets, but the planned city thing. Houses were built of mud brick and had beamed flat mud roofs, open courts, and porticos, and also they had the earliest examples of supporting wooden columns. But the city was actually only a temporary site for the workers building the Alahun Pyramid to live in, so it was abandoned after the pyramids were finished. Another grand creation is number seven, the Great Wall of Benin. That fun little quip is actually in regards to the size of this Nigerian medieval kingdom. It's said to be built on scale comparable to the Great Wall of China, but there wasn't one giant wall at all. There was hundreds of walls, a vast system of defense totaling 10,000 miles in all, considered the largest earthworks in the world carried out prior to the mechanical era. Benin City's planning and design are miraculous too, according to the careful rules of fractal design. 
lines, which uses symmetry, proportionality, and repetition. The city and its surrounding villages were laid out to form perfect fractals. That was also repeated in the rooms of each house, the house itself, and the cluster of houses in the village in mathematically predictable patterns. Large streets comprised of sprawling series of structures for living, stores, and public buildings interconnected by innumerable doors and passageways, all which were richly decorated with the art that made Benin famous. In the early foreign explorers written descriptions of Benin city, it portrayed it as a place free of crime and hunger, with large streets and houses kept clean, a city filled with courteous, honest people and run by a centralized and highly sophisticated bureaucracy. Just remember that in the same year, an English professor described London, England as thievery, sex work, murder, bribery, and a thriving black market made by the medieval city ripe for exploitation. But man, did those Brits love to call everyone else primitive. Since we're discussing how revolutionary African cities are, number six is advanced construction for historic times, at least in comparison to the European world. There are endless descriptions from visitors to some of these cities that spin tales of intense grandeur that seem almost impossible given the tools and slow progression of society at the time. But Africa wasn't slow, and that's what people don't seem to know. So let's run through some real life documented examples. Chinese records of the 15th century AD note that Mogadishu had houses of four or five stories high. A comment verified by archaeologists, houses fully intact and still inhabitable today have been found in Old Dijin in Mali, several stories high, but also with underground rooms, staircases, and connecting halls. Sudan in the 9th century AD also had multi-level houses, also differing in spatial layouts and functioning water systems, and water heating systems for the kitchen and bathroom. A ruined mosque in the Kenyan city Gedi was found to have a water purifying system made of limestone so as to recycle and filter their water. Multiple palaces found, such as Husuni Kabwa and Mount Fiora, have been found to have chandeliers, murals, swimming pools, and real glass windows. Fueled by oils, many of these cities also had street lighting alongside their citywide sewer and and water systems. Had colonialists not blindly rampaged in like children, maybe they could have learned something that improved their societies and made them progress quicker, instead of just decimating others and everything being lost to time. Number five, book burning. This is one of the more tragic stories, but it's gotta be talked about. During Qin Shi Huang's rule, Chancellor Li Shi convinced the emperor that all records excluding the Qin needed to be burned. Not only that, but anyone possessing copies of the Shi Jing, the Shu Jin, and or any other writings from the hundred schools of philosophy had to turn their copies in for summary roasting or they'd get whacked. Not only that, but he suggested a mass state of censorship, which was the actual censorship and not the kind that you uh, right wing morons whine about happening in video games or whatever. Hmm? Basically anyone who referenced the books, talked about them in any way, or god forbid used them to criticize the government, were to be borked brutally and quickly. Qin Shi Huang thought this was a great idea and got to work erasing thousands of collections of poetry, history, and philosophy. He even went out of his way to execute 460 scholars whom he just happened to overhear complaining about his stupid new rules. I would weep about this loss for hours, but poet Zhang Ji's work titled Pits for Book Burning is far better for it than I. Quote, As the smoke from burning bamboo and silk clears, the empire is weakened. The Hangu Pass and the Yellow River guard the domain of Qin Shi Huang in vain. Pits of ash were not yet cold. Disorder reigned east of the Zhao Mountains. As it turned out, Liu Bang and Zhang Yu could not read. Number four, high speed cultural revolution. We've said it already, but it really can't be overstated that the speed in which Qin Shi Huang implemented new cultural rules and laws was absolutely incredible. Even the Meiji Restoration period that effectively brought Japan into what was considered the modern age for that time, it took about around 21 years. And that was a messy affair that could get an entire video by itself. But consider the relative population contained within China. Consider the size of China and the size of the Qin Empire. All of this territory was shaped by a period of about a decade and a half, to the point where it wouldn't be until 1912 that there would be a major upheaval to the system. Obviously, it saw improvisation, adaptation, and change over the years, but just as Qin Shi Huang was laying the foundation for a wall that he envisioned would span the entirety of China, I wonder if he knew that the system of government that he was implementing would last nearly as long. Of course, the means by which this was achieved involved massive cultural manipulation and fascistic ideals, not to mention the body count. 
Actually, no, let's mention that. Number three, the body count of Qin rule. Okay, now while the Qin dynasty was important, it should be noted that the results of such a tyrannical rule were bloody indeed. Between high taxes, wars of conquest, and the beginning of the construction of the Great Wall, historians estimate that around 20 million people passed during Qin rule. An absolutely staggering number given, again, its decade and a half duration. The construction of the wall alone was estimated to have contributed to around 1 million of those, and it wasn't finished until long after Qin fell. It's a sobering reminder to keep in mind that while acts of war are devastating, the management or mismanagement of those in power can be far more destructive. Number 2. Qin Shi Huang's Quest for Immortality So it uh, turns out it ain't great to be king. As his reign continued, Qin Shi Huang's paranoia increased, only emboldened as three consecutive attempts on his life were made. This this paranoia turned to obsession with the elixir of life, a fabled drink which might imbue him with immortality. His quest led him on a search for the Penglai Mountain, where a thousand-year-old magician had supposedly invited him. Qin Shi Huang had also ordered an expedition to search for the elixir, but they uh, never returned, likely due to being afraid of the consequences for returning empty-handed. It's actually suspected that uh, some of them did escape to Japan and may have settled there, though accounts in this area are pretty weak. Anyways, in uh, 211, a meteor landed in Donjun, and some cheeky bugger inscribed the words, The first emperor will die and his lands will be divided. Since nobody took credit for the masterful prank, everyone in the area was executed, and the stone destroyed. Finally, Qin Shi Hong passed, potentially due to illness, but as many fun stories go, it's actually rumored that he was killed by a seditious physician with a false illness elixir containing mercury. Number 1. Li Shi's Return It's fortunate that the end of the Qin Empire is as interesting as its beginning. Qin Shi Huang is dead, and Li Shi and chief eunuch Zhao Gao have to somehow keep everything together. For starters, there was the job of getting the emperor's body back, which they handled by hiding it in a caravan of dead fish. Seriously. But they had another problem. They just flat out didn't want the emperor's choice of successor, Fu Su, to take the throne, as it'd probably mean that they'd lose their jobs. So betraying the newly passed emperor, they tricked Fusu into taking his own life by giving him a falsified document from his dad that just told him to do it. Zhao Gao then betrayed Li Shi, charging him with treason, and the conspirator was subjected to the five punishments. Mo, where the offender is tattooed on the face with ink, Yi, where the offender's nose is cut off, Yu, or Yue, where the offender's feet are cut Cut off, Gong, where the offenders are removed, and finally Da Pi, which was carried out by chopping at the waist. It'd be easy to say that Li Si was half the man he aimed to be, but just please cut the joke here, that was really stupid. Kick it off the list at number 10, Smokey Behind. When somebody tells you that you're just blowing smoke, it means that you're lying, okay? You've now been given exaggerated information of sorts. Well, back in the 18th century, they literally had to blow tobacco smoke at your Behind. Yeah, weirdest work break ever, I'd say. So why did we perform magician enemas back in the day? What was the deal here? Well, tobacco smoke enemas were used to treat quite a few symptoms, or they thought so, including a common cold. These enemas came in these fancy kits with a fancy rubber tube. It was all fancy because it was an honest medical practice at the time. It was done by legit medical practitioners. This is the funniest part. The idea was that the tobacco smoke could warm up a soon to be deceased body. The nicotine would stimulate your adrenal glands, jolting you back into good health. The best health, might we say. And the way they would do it in the mid 1800s was by just blowing smoke and just waiting, seeing what happened. We're figuratively and literally blowing smoke. That's the origin of that saying. Fun fact there. Imagine doing that today. Like, hey, I think I dislocated my shoulder. What do I do? He's like, hey, one sec. Number nine, alarm clocks. While the medical world was one threat in Victorian times, apparently so was the technological side. Who knew? We obviously didn't have reliable alarm clocks back in the 1800s, obviously, but we did have jobs. So in order to get up on time, lamp lighters or knockers would come by and tip you off. Yeah, they would just yell in your window and just 
alarm. That's how you'd wake up. A man would yell into your window and smack you with a stick. Legend has it, a young man named Sam Wardell, he got a little creative with his wake up calls. He needed more than a lamp lighter at 5 a.m. so he would Tony Stark this alarm clock gadget. He would use wires, a bunch of stones, all that unsafe stuff. Then at a certain time, stones would fall to the ground, of course waking him up and presumably everyone else in the building. That would be alarming. Well, Christmas Eve, 1885, tragedy unfolded. A few friends had come over for a holiday visit, so Sam had to move some furniture around, rightfully so, to make room for, you know, windmills and break dancing, whatever they did in Victorian Christmas times. The next morning, he forgot to put things back in the small apartment, and the obvious happened. The rocks then fell on him while he was asleep. Yeah, that probably doesn't feel too good. I thought iPhone alarms were jarring. I take back everything I've ever said. Number eight, relaxative. Okay, so right off the bat, the Victorian era was a little messy. I'm sure you've gathered this by now here on Bumblebee. But these messy new illnesses were putting lots of pressure on medical practitioners, so they were desperate for these new treatments. We laugh at Victorian medical treatments, but they tried, okay? They at least tried. They also achieved many medical breakthroughs as well. But when it comes to handling chicken pox in the Victorian era, well, that wasn't one of them. That was not our finest hour. Chicken pox in the Victorian era was being treated by using laxatives. Yeah, let that sink in for a moment. I have chicken pox, what should I do? Well, try some laxatives. Yeah, folks would slam some castor oil and then, ready for this? They would get even more sick. Who would have thought? You thought you were uncomfortable before, castor oil, yeah, chug that, and then now you're even weaker, now you're dead. Number seven, backed up. Let's say it's the Victorian era and let's say you're constipated, right? It happens, you know? Well, bad ideas will most likely follow, if you didn't already guess that. According to Merck's 1899 medical manual, small amounts of strychnine were prescribed to those who were constipated. Yeah, the strychnose nux vomica was thought to better the gastric functions. Even a small amount of this stuff would attack your respiratory system. You'd contract, you convulse, it's horrible. It'd be a painful way to go out. It's much, much worse than being constipated. Any day, I would much rather be constipated than any type of strychnine, are you kidding me? Number six, leeches. I grew up with hearing problems. I've been around the block with earaches, ear infections. I had ear tubes numerous times, all that jazz. So I feel really bad for the folks in this next one, okay? I hear you, pun intended. In the Victorian era, medical practitioners would say to use leeches for your ear infections. That's the number one trick, they don't want you to know. There it is. Once they're attached to you, the idea was that they can numb pain while at the same time providing proteins and peptides to its host. So on paper, again, the idea made sense. But the science didn't quite follow, did it? It wasn't entirely hopeless though. Recently in 2004, the FDA reintroduced leeches to the medical world, yeah, because their bite can break up blood clots and induce blood flow. So it's not entirely hopeless. We talked about leech collectors on this channel before, so of course we have to talk about more of the science that they were hoping to achieve with it, right? Also, I worked at a retirement home when I was 16. I thought that job sucked. Imagine being a leech collector? No way. Number five, World War II. Well, surely after the most destructive conflict in human history, we wouldn't be so keen on another, right? Well, wrong. That could be the point right there, but the unusual event that started World War II was nothing. Just like that episode of Seinfeld. It, it was a war about nothing, George. I don't know. Well, not true, but let me explain. The factors leading up to World War II were all there. Fascism, communism, imperial expansion, again. Revenge, unification, however, honestly like a bunch of bad parents letting their kids get away with anything, nobody really did anything to stop Mustache Man. They used a policy called appeasement, which basically meant he wants something, he gets it. He wants something, he gets it. Not a great, not a great system. Okay, you can have that country, but no more. That's it, we appease you enough. Oh, okay, you can have that one, but next time, no more. That's it, for real. Oh, fine, you can have that one too, but now I'm putting my foot down. And after four or five countries fell to Mustache Man, that's when they finally did something. So really, it was neglect. Number four, Jenkins Ear. 1731, Britain. They were looking for an excuse to attack Spain. After all, they've got a lot of loot and gold, and come on, that belongs to Britain. It's gonna go in our museum, come on, that makes sense. They had just about run out of hope until Jenkins walked into the room. Sounds like a joke, but it's true. Jenkins was an English sailor who had gotten into a confrontation with Spanish authorities eight years prior. Sadly for Jenkins, it cost him his ear. They took off his ear, because that's what, that's what you do back then. And as soon as the British caught wind of his ear, 
Well, it was on. So yes, they did start a war over a man's missing ear because it's a good reason to steal gold. Number three, the War of the Bucket. Modena and Bologna, two warring Italian city states, one sponsored by the big man in the big hat, which is the Pope as they call him I think, and the other was the Holy Roman Emperor. Big power struggle, who's, who's in charge, I don't know. This was kind of the way it went in ye olde medieval Europe. However, in 1325 it began to get a little spicy, as both Medina and Bologna would make a day out of raiding each other's cities, because even though we're pretty similar we'll just attack each other, because yeah, sure. However, it got real serious when Bologna's bucket went missing. Oh. It started a war, and the real ironic thing is it might not have been stolen at all and just blamed in confusion of a missing bucket. Medina steals a bucket, we gotta get him. How dare you take my bucket? It's kinda like when your sibling takes your favorite toy. You did what to my action figure? You know what I mean? Number two, the console war. My generation probably remembers the PS3 versus Xbox 360 war. I'm pretty sure Chris remembers that, he does. See? But the real one was Sega versus Nintendo in the 90s. Well, how did it start? Okay, well, Nintendo was on a huge roll. Super Mario, Metroid, Zelda, you couldn't stop them. That was until the Sega Genesis released with the edgiest blue hedgehog ever to grace your old TVs. Millions of dollars in smear campaigns, Genesis does what Nintendo doesn't. I'm sure you guys all remember. That, that commercial, it was a really powerful commercial. I, I, I learned about it in, 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 in business class, so there you go, look at that. And number one, the Russo-Japanese War. This one's crazy. How about a war, cause it'll make us look cool, said the advisors to Tsar Nicholas II, worried the Russian Empire didn't look so cool anymore cause it's been failing for a while. And in a classic schoolyard tactic, let's find the weakest link and start there. Well, they thought it was Japan, but as it turns out, Japan wasn't that guy, pal. He's not that guy, pal. And and they won, so very surprising literally everyone. So not only did a massive European power start a conflict with a puny island nation for bragging rights, but they also lost that war to a puny island nation for bragging rights. That's just crazy. Eating with the rich starts off the countdown at number 10. Medieval recipes depict a large variety of animals being served. Adding to the ones I listed previously are horses, lampreys, cranes, and crows. Hell, even beavers. And let's not forget the animals created by their chefs. One homemade animal was called a cock and trice, and it was actually multiple animals' bodies put together before being roasted. A helmeted cock was another chef creation. It was a roasted chicken wearing a a tiny helmet that was sat on the back of a roasted pig because why not? Dinner in a show is always fun, so in late medieval Europe, it became fashionable to have an entremetta, which was an entertainment dish. One such example is bakers cooked a pie shell in advance, and then after it cooled, they placed live birds inside the pie and resealed it. When cut at the table, the birds would then all fly out of the pie, much to the amazement of the many banquet guests, assuming that all went accordingly. FIFA fans may want to skip out on this next one, because number nine in our countdown is making football illegal. That's right, while I may be referring to it as primarily soccer in this video, what was still called football at the time was made illegal in the medieval ages. Now there are quite a few reasons for this. Most popularly known is that the sport was extremely different then. It was violent and aggressive, resembling more of a mass brawl with minimal rules. However, it was also because only two years after soccer was banned in 1363, King Edward III would implement a mandatory archery education law. This would ensure his villagers could be used as soldiers should need be. King Edward believed that soccer, but also sports in general such as handball, football, hockey, and cockfighting were distractions and at that time they could be doing better things. I'm sure there are many of you that would disagree. Next on the countdown is number 8, the future predicting friar. There's a lot to unpack here so I'll just jump right in. English Francican monk Roger Bacon is known through history for his shockingly accurate predictions of the future transportation and life that we have now. Bacon lived from 1214 until 1292 and was the successful creator of the magnifying glass. But he also famously predicted future machinery in his book Espetola de Secretis Opribus, if I got that right. Cars can be made so that without animals, people will move unbelievably rapid. And flying machines can be constructed so that a man sits in the midst of a machine, revolving some engines by which artificial wings are made to beat in the air like a flying bird. It's a little nonsensical, but 
you can see what he's implying. His other predictions included steamships, submarines, diving suits, and telescopes. That's pretty spot on for a guy who lived thousands of years ago. This is the same man who was also said to have sculpted a prophetic head of brass. Apparently having been warned by a spirit that he must listen to whenever the head first spoke, Bacon set his assistant Miles to watch over the sculpture, which he did even past Bacon's demise. It's said that after the friar's death, however, that was the first time it spoke. First saying, time is. Then, time passed. Ignored both times by a confused Miles, the head spoke only once more to say time is past before it exploded into flames. And so the chance to consult the mysterious head was lost when it combust. What do you think of the legendary Bacon and his stories of mysticism? Time is past, as the sculpted head said, so let's be happy we left this weird tradition in the past. In at number 7 in the countdown, it's the medieval animal trials. Under the ruler's power, there was no exception to medieval law. And so it should come as no surprise that even animals could face the brunt of their alleged crimes. This was no casual affair. The rich and the poor gathered for these trials as spectators. Some of the accused animals were even dressed in wigs and gloves, fancy garments to be seen in front of the royal court as their fate was debated by the lawmakers. That should come as no surprise either, seeing as the medieval era wasn't exactly overflowing with entertainment outlets. There are records of at least 85 animal trials that had taken place during medieval slash middle age. And while the most serious offenders were pigs by a landslide, there are records of some roosters and even one donkey facing the judge. What were these animals being charged for, you may be asking? Many times it was the act of attacking or eating humans, as food and grain for animals was so sparse they'd often go hungry. There were also some accused of being heathens or thieves or behaving in lustuous ways. So make sure you have a walking buddy and always look over your shoulder because I guess you never know when an ill-attentioned cow may be creeping up on you. Number 6 in the countdown is the St. Scholastica Day Riot. February 10th of 1355, a group of students who attended Oxford University decide to go into town for a pint at the Swindlestock Tavern. Little did they or anyone else know that this would be the start of a notoriously famous riot. It started with belligerent complaints to the tavern owner about the quality of their drinks and service. As the tavern owner was progressively more berated, he and other patrons lost their temper with these students. The escalation led to a verbal sparring between the students and bar patrons. Both sides ended up arming themselves, but luckily things were quickly interrupted when the mayor stepped in and demanded the arrest of the students who had harassed and assaulted the tavern owner, thus sparking this whole disaster. What should have been a peaceful resolution caused a chain reaction, however. Oxford students rose up in protest of their peers' arrest and swarmed to attack the mayor. News of that quickly spread and the townsfolk revolted immediately. Many of them were already very tired of these students and their entitled complex and had been waiting for the opportunity to rage against them. The riot that occurred ended the lives of 63 students and 30 locals. While the case's investigation led to Oxford winning against the town in court, the Oxford Council was still made to parade shamefully through the village every year on February 10th, and they did have to pay a fine to the families of each student lost. Number five, the Challenger crew. This is a photo that was taken of the well, clearly the very excited Challenger crew right before when they're walking down the ramp ready to head off on their mission. Now, this photo is chilling, but it's nice to see them happy and together. The crew even included, at the time, 37-year-old Kristen McAuliffe, who was a high school social studies teacher. You may remember this, but your parents definitely do. See, she had won a spot on the mission through a program with NASA called the Teacher in Space Program, and she had trained diligently for months in order to be the first ever non-military individual in space. On January 28th, 1986, the Challenger mission proved to be fateful just 73 seconds after liftoff. See, two rubber O-rings failed because of the cold temperatures that morning, and on live television, the world had to watch as a spacecraft broke apart and then fell into the ocean, sadly taking the lives of everybody on board the craft. Now, I'm not sure if you've watched the documentary on Netflix, but it's a mini-series about this whole thing and it's powerful stuff. It's really emotional, I just finished it and it's moving. Number four. The core. <clears throat> this photo shows a physicist named Harold Agnew, and while this photo looks relatively normal and scientific or whatever, a non-threatening photo, what he has in his hands is truly devastating. It changed history. Harold is holding the nuclear core of what was nicknamed the Fat Man. Yeah, that thing. This means that Harold is now holding the nuclear core of the atomic weapon that was later dropped on Nagasaki in 1945. The immediate blast took many 
many lives, as well as the long-term effects of radiation illnesses. Now, it's crazy to look at a photo like this because it seems so perfectly normal when he literally has a life-changing, world-ending device in the palm of his hand, like a literal supervillain holding kryptonite. I couldn't imagine seeing that, let alone holding it. No way. My grandmother wouldn't even hold me as a baby because I was too small and fragile. <laughs> Think she'd hold this? No way. Butterfingers. Butterfingers galore over there. Number three, the ball of burning men. January 28th, 1393, you are formal invited to a masquerade ball. How fun is that? <laughs> Who is it under that mask? Oh, it's just Taylor on Bumblebee. Love him. He's great. The French Queen Isabeau of Bavaria is now hosting one of the most lavish parties of the decade, right? So bring your finest and longest crook house. Roll it in style. Now, when the French royal court was celebrating the marriage of one of the Queen's ladies in waiting, it of course was a big deal. It's fun. It's a big happy day. For some, the best days of their lives. For others at this ball, not so great. Probably the last days of their lives. King Charles Charles VI had five companions perform a dance or a theater routine of sorts. Now they did a performance as beasts. They were committed to the bin, right? They had these big, lovely masks, big baggy outfits, lots of linen, lots of stuffing to appear as if they were real beasts. Now the party was going well, wine was spilling, people were laughing, beasts were roaring, we were committed, but one rule beforehand was put into place before the party started. Absolutely, positively, no open flames. Obviously, right? I mean, look at that guy. He looks like a couch. We're not gonna put a match near him. It's gonna be chaos. The Duke of Orleans had a little too much fun prior to this event, and he forgot the first rule of Fight Club when he arrived. The guy walked in with a lit torch. He wanted to see everyone. Some accounts say he dropped the torch by accident. Others say he got too close trying to guess the identity of said beasts. Either way, this tragic event took the lives of four people, hence the name, Ball of the Burning Men. That's terrible, imagine that, what a gig. Number two, Stanford Prison Experiment. One of the most well-known experiments of all time was the Stanford Prison Experiment. It was an attempt to investigate the psychological effects of perceived power, and it worked. A little too well, I'd say. Guards and prisoners were all chosen randomly from college students to anyone, your neighbor. You had no idea. Nobody really knew just how bad this experiment would end up, so anyone volunteered. Those in power were taking it to an extreme level. It was absolute psychological distress. Some of the prisoners went insane. The whole exercise was abandoned after only six days, which is not a short amount of time, but historians say just six days because it was intended to last much longer. Now, it's shocking to see the lengths people go after receiving power over another human being. I thought I was evil unplugging my brother's controller and like playing, you know, and he wasn't plugged in. This is like... Next level. And finally, number one, mummified pets. Are you a pet owner? If so, comment down below which animals fill your house. We love that. Olivia and I want to get a dog so bad. I was always a dog guy growing up. My aunt had three pugs. It was the dream. I love it. Ancient Egyptians, they fancied a house pet or two. We know this. But Egyptians saw animals as incarnations of the gods, which I do too with my shih tzu, of course. The very concept of having a pet came from ancient Egyptians, so thank you. Egyptians were, of course, fans of cats. That's common knowledge at this point. But did you know they also had the same idea for hawks, lions, dogs, and baboons? Yeah, baboons. That's amazing. Go ask your parents for a baboon as a pet. There you go. I thought dogs doing their business inside was annoying, but a lion? Your arm's gonna be tired scooping that one up. Many of these animals were often mummified and buried with their owners after they'd passed, just like how many owners today cremate their pets. I mean, I'm not sure I would mummify a shih tzu, but hey, whatever floats your boat. Who am I to judge? Other creatures were specially trained to work as helper animals back then. So ancient Egyptian police officers officers would use dogs and monkeys to help patrolling, then they'd mummify them. What a time, imagine that. Number 10, the War of Unification. While technically pre-Empire, the Qin Wars of Unification are sick and nobody can stop me from talking about them. Prior to their campaign, the relatively small state of Qin had evolved to gain a surprising degree of prominence, becoming one of the seven major states in power at the time. Now this was due to the numerous battle centuries prior that I can't talk about this time, but I, I promise they were really cool, one of which was actually credited as basically being responsible for the unification of China, despite it having ha occurred like 40 years prior. Just look up the Battle of Shangpeng. It was wild. In any case, the War of Unification was a result of this, running from uh, 230 to 221 BC. It saw Ying Zheng declaring war on the states of Han, Zhao, Wei, Yan, and Qi, conquering them in just about that order. This led to a complete unification of China, an effort which only took barely a decade to complete. Number nine, the Dazhejian Uprising. Skipping ahead a bit into the future, following the spoilers, 
death of Qin Shi Huang, there were a bunch of uprisings. Also known as the Chen Sheng and Wu Guang Rebellion, named after its respective leaders, the uprising began when two officers were ordered to lead their soldiers to defend Yu Yang. Halted by flooding, they realized that due to Qin laws, being late for their government job would result in their executions without respect for the excuse. So they did what anyone would do. Rile up the peasants and go for a good old revolution. And better than getting slaughtered for missing a shift, right? Well, they thought so. And managed to get around 900 peasants to back their cause. How they did this isn't completely confirmed, but there are two stories about how they might have gone about the process, and both are really weird. See, one story goes that Chen Sheng and Wu Guang wrote the words King Chen Sheng on some silk, and then fed that silk to a fish. When the fish was was purchased and presumably cut open by soldiers, they saw the message and thought it was sick. Another story goes that they supposedly taught animals to say, Da Chu flourishes King Chen Shang, which likely would have had a similar effect on anyone who heard that from like a cow. So now, these might be slightly embellished, but they're also really funny, so come on. Either way, they got stopped by the chief, so it doesn't really matter. Number eight, getting owned zoned by a peasant. Now, we're getting outside of the actual reign of the Qin again, but uh, I don't care. The Qin dynasty post-death of Qin Shi Huang was an absolute mess. Leaders were desperately trying to consolidate power, body their opposition, and avoid getting bodied in the process. The effective orchestrators of the chaos, Li Si and Zhao Gao, who we will get to, had a massive falling out which resulted in Li Shi's execution. Zhao Gao was trying to run everything, deposing the old emperor in favor of a new one, who then got rid of Zhao Gao. But the new emperor, Ji Ying, was a moron, and so eventually a real revolt uh, broke out in uh, 209. The rebels of Chu, led by uh, Lieutenant uh, Liu Bang and leader Zhang Yu, managed to defeat Ji Ying in in 207 BC. Of course, in traditional period fashion, Liu Bang betrayed Zhang Yu and founded the Han Dynasty, despite being a peasant. I have been in car accidents that have had less whiplash than the last, like, two years of the Qin Dynasty. Oh, and uh, Liu Bang was, like, a peasant, by the way. A, a, a peasant who became the ruler of China. Number seven, the Terracotta Warriors. Okay, so you probably know a little bit about this one. In 1974, a bunch a bunch of farmers in the Lin Tong County managed to dig up this exceptional find. Three pits containing statues of 8,000 soldiers, 130 chariots with 520 horses, and 150 cavalry horses. Construction on the tomb began during Qin Shi Huang's reign. He had a thing about dying, but uh, we'll get into that later. And the soldiers were originally painted, though due to the climate and about roughly two millennia of time, it it uh, kind of faded. There have been arguments that some of the paint could have been sourced from Greece, although the idea that the Greeks and the Qin Dynasty ever made content is hotly contested, so I'm not getting into that. But it can't really be stated in words how massive this project was. Every soldier was armed. Every single one constructed by hand, and the tomb itself is about 98 square kilometers, or you know, 38 square miles for the Yanks in the audience. Easily one of the single most impressive pieces of architecture known to man, it's just yet another impressive reminder of the exact scale and scope of the Qin Dynasty. Number six, the 12 statues. All right, story time. So when Qin Shi Huang defeated the six other states in his quest for dominance, he demanded that every single conquered state hand over all of their weapons to him. He then melted those weapons and reportedly had them cast into 12 massive metal statues and a couple of bells or something. Each were reported to weigh about a thousand don, or roughly 133,000 pounds. Now, where are these colossi now? Well, a few centuries after the fall of Qin, Emperor Dong Zhuo reportedly had about nine of them melted down to make 
coins. However, because the statues were made out of a hodgepodge of different metals, and more importantly because Dong Zhuo is a moron, uh, the coins didn't weigh the same, which resulted in the mass devaluing of all copper cash. I really want to do a video on Lu Bu and specifically how he offed Dong Zhuo. The guy, that guy was a creep. Anyways, uh, as for the other three statues, nobody really knows where they are, so maybe there's another discovery on a similar level to the Terracotta Warriors on the horizon. Number five, Queen Nefertiti's disappearance. Ruling alongside the Pharaoh Akhenaten from 1353 to 1336 BC, Queen Nefertiti, aka Lady of Grace, aka Hereditary Princess, was born in 1370 BC. She was born in the Egyptian city of Thebes. She was only 15 years old when she married 16 year old Akhenaten. Again, always so young and just forced. This family forced fun. She worshipped the sun god Aten at the time, and alongside her young husband, she built a new capital called Armana. She even created a new religion, she was onto some good stuff. She ruled over what's now considered the wealthiest period in Egyptian history. Nefertiti had six children, which were all daughters. Many believe this has something to do with her disappearance. After reconstructing Egypt's religious and political structure, soaring to new heights as a woman in the Egyptian court, the queen just vanished. Yeah, historically, just like that, boom. During the 12th year of the 17 that her husband ruled for, historical records seem to have just wiped out the queen's side of the legacy. She was gone from everything, and many believe that she didn't actually die, but rather, she disguised herself and continued to rule. See, the next in line after Akhenaten's reign was Pharaoh Smenkeher. Was that really enough for Titi in disguise? I hope so. That's like some she's the man stuff right there. The reason we believe she may have disguised herself as a man is because of the female pharaoh, Hapshaput. She ruled with a fake beard in the 15th century, so it's possible, we've seen it. And lastly, there's a theory that the reason Nefertiti was banished was because she couldn't produce a male hair. Like I mentioned, she had six daughters and then she disappeared. This is, this is ancient history we're talking about. Always brutal, no matter what. Beautiful, but brutal. Number four, Cleopatra's. Sure, she may have been born in Egypt, but Cleopatra, despite what many believe, was not Egyptian. She was the last Greek ruler of Egypt, and after Alexander the Great's death in 323 BC, Ptolemy then took over Egypt, which in turn launched this wave, this dynasty of Greek rulers that lasted for centuries. DNA-wise, she was barely Egyptian, but as she grew up, she was determined to learn all about Egyptian culture. And due to political structure, she started to style herself after the god Goddess Isis. She was the first Cleopatra that claimed to be Isis after the third Cleopatra. Yeah, there's way more than we think. There's like seven. Number three, King Ramses VIII. The last son of Ramses III. He's the seventh pharaoh of the 20th dynasty. King Ramses VIII. Yeah, history is confusing with these numbers sometimes. I gotta tell you, I had to type that one out a few times. I was like eight, third, carry the eight, nine, Ramses what? The lost king had the throne for a very short amount of time and historians are trying to understand why that is. What exactly happened? When the King Joffrey went wrong with King Ramses VIII here, he was the only pharaoh of the 20th dynasty whose tomb is still lost in the Valley of the Kings. So maybe it's not even there. And the thing is, with his ruling being so short, the theory out there is that the tomb of KV-19 that belonged to the son of Ramses IX, many believe this tomb was originally built for Ramses VIII. But once he became king, everybody saw his true colors. They must have changed their mind at that point or changed their lane or something. They were like, eh, uh, maybe not him, you know? There is a confirmed tomb that was never used for Ramses VIII, and that was tomb QV43. That was in the Valley of the Queens. It was made for him, but never used. Again, more mysteries. Oh, the poor souls who had to build all these tombs, and they're like, you don't need it? Okay. 57 years to make that tomb. You sure you don't need it? Okay. Number two. Baboon police. Ancient Egyptians worshipped lots of animals. We mentioned that earlier. They had zoos and elephants surrounded in ivory, all that good stuff. At one point or another, you've heard about how cats were highly respected back then, worshipped. But they also worshipped other animals as well. Sorry, cat people. Yeah, other animals are fun. Like baboons, believe it or not. They were pretty important pieces to this ancient Egyptian puzzle. Egyptians had tattoos of baboons all over them. This was before Harambe, or, you know? Anyone monumental like that ever came around. The most famous piece of history that we have preserved is in the collection of the British Museum in London. There's a mummy on display and it looks a little slightly different than the rest. EA6736, fun name, but he was recovered from the Temple of Cones in Luxor, Egypt. This little man dates back to the New Kingdom period, so anywhere around 1550 BC to 10 BC. Yeah. He's quite old. Baboons would appear in art and religion all over ancient Egypt, and one of my favorite facts ever has to be that in ancient Egyptian times, pharaohs would train baboons to make 
arrests. Yeah, imagine stealing food and trying to run away and then you look back and there's four baboons doing parkour behind you telling you to stop resisting, hucking bananas at you. That's crazy. And number one, false doors. Imagine searching for a lost Egyptian tomb your entire life, all right? Imagine you spent years of your life dedicating everything to this research and you finally find this door, this ancient door. You find an entrance carved into the wall. This is it. What lies beyond? You try and carefully open it with a team of archaeologists, but it won't budge because it is a fake door, my friends. It is a false door. Yeah, you just got juked out from a guy 4,500 years ago. He's like, gotcha. <sighs> Took long, we did it. False doors in ancient Egyptian tombs are very common. Ancient Egyptians believed that these false doors were a connection to the dead. How beautiful is that? And that is how spirits were able to travel from here to there and back and forth. See, most false doors can be found on the west wall because Egyptians believed the west to be the land of the dead. The west, that's the west. Which way? Which way is north? Your west, my east. How does that sound? There we go. Those are the top 10 unusual events from ancient Egypt. If you want a part two, I'll gladly return and dig up the past any day. Number 10, the pig wars. If there's one thing Americans love besides Dunkin' Donuts, I mean, I'm, I'm just assuming because your commercials tell me that America runs on Dunkin's. If it's not that, it's manifest destiny. It seems the second the founding fathers and patriots won their freedom, they wanted just a wee bit more and took over what is now the United United States of America from coast to coast. Thing is, Britain was also still there in a land known as Canada, or actually British North America, or Rupert's Land if you went to Canadian history class. The British were doing the same thing and expanding westward. They both got to the Pacific West Coast and everything was cool, kosher, great. Well, except for some islands not too far from the mainland. It was heavily debated on who actually owned these islands. Well, it almost turned into another global war. Both Americans and British were living on the island. When a British-owned pig had gone one step too far and eaten out of an American field, the pig paid the price with his life, causing tensions to escalate to the point where the Navy and high-ranking officers got involved. Ooh, not good. Partially being stoked by an American who to this day, no one knows the method to his madness, but apparently he was looking for a fight regardless. Kind of a weird story. All over a pig. Jeez. Number nine, the Anglo-Zanzibar War. One day, a disgruntled nephew got rid of his uncle and took the Zanzibar throne for his own. Classic story, when it come to royals, that's what they do. Naturally, the British who said dibs on Zanzibar were not all too pleased, as they had someone else in mind for the throne. Someone who would let them in and keep empiring as they do. So this angry nephew said, nah, I don't think so fam. Ain't have a not. And he started to organize the troops. And in a nutshell, said, you know what? Why don't you come on in and try and stop me? You and one army. Well, it was the British Army. They did, and it's been recorded as the shortest conflict in human history, lasting only 45 minutes. The nephew escaped to the German embassy, and the British moved in. The rest is colonial history. What a great story. Number eight, the football war. It started with the leaders of Honduras and El Salvador. There was some agriculture and land disputes growing and the leader of Honduras made it worse by using El Salvador migrants as scapegoats for their problems. Classic dictator move, am I right? Come on. Tensions kept getting hotter to the point where people were being treated differently and that's not good. And because history is a funny thing, the 1970 World Cup at the time was going to be played by the both feuding nations. The passion, the rage, the anger, the music, they got good music down there, was poured into that game. Well, it was enough for El Salvador to cut all diplomatic ties and after the game, declare war outside of the soccer stadium. For real. People got hurt. It wasn't good. Man, that's rough. Number seven, the Emu War. Say what you will about country folk, but when small town folks band together as one, anything can be accomplished. Well, let's take a trip down under so I can talk about the Emu War. The Great Depression was tough. That was the case for Australian farmers. It was actually a little extra hard for them too. Unfortunately for the farmers, they also had an emu problem. Large birds eating and destroying their crops. I mean, they're massive. You see an emu, they're like, they're like this big, they're huge. The government in all her powerful glory decided to step in and lend a hand. They sent out soldiers with trucks and machine blam blam. So obviously the people got rid of the emus, right? It makes sense. There's the armies here. We're gonna get rid of them, no problem. Well, no. What should have been an easy work unfolded into the emu war. Weeks of trying to hunt down the pesky emus. It was somewhat ineffective. One politician joked that emus should be awarded medals for their bravery in standing up to the soldiers. That's just crazy. That's just, wow. Number six, World War One. 
While there are many factors that led to World War I, and some that you might not hear in the classroom, but in a nutshell, new technology, militarism, imperialism, and a general distaste for each other were all thrown into a pot. She was turned on high, and when Archduke Franz Ferdinand was assassinated in Sarajevo, she was turned on high, really hot, when Archduke Franz Ferdinand was assassinated in Sarajevo. A lot of people will tell you that's where it started, and they're not wrong. However, there was a lot of miscommunication and correspondence that had to happen between the empires first. In a series of very tragic events, leaders were on vacation, didn't get messages, people sat on war declarations, and before peace could be made, people were pointing fingers and playing the blame game, which is pretty much what got boots on the ground and or to the grounds. Wasn't good. So in a nutshell, World War I was started by miscommunication. That's kind of awkward. Number five, basket of bees. Guess what this one is? It's pretty much, that's exactly what it is. It's horrible. We often look at ancient Rome as the birthplace for numerals, modern plumbing, social life, all that good stuff. Don't get it twisted. Ancient Rome had a lot in common with the dark ages as well, okay? The punishments that they would inflict on others, horribly creative, I'll say that. Like for example, a basket of bees. A basket of bees, there we go. Maybe wasps, who knows, I don't know. History gets all crazy, you know? This punishment saw the victim placed in a large woven basket, naked, might I add. Then the basket was hoisted up near a beehive, of course, and then Romans would just anger the hive. They would just shake the basket. And then in turn, all these bees would sting said victim to death. This was meant to be a long and painful death, but eventually, this is how humans realized folks were allergic to bees because they would meet their demise a little too fast, you know? Romans would be like, eh, what happened? What's going on? Are we going home now? That's it? Number four, the Colosseum. They say Rome wasn't built in a day, right? Right? No, I'm asking you, I don't know. That's a saying, I think I've heard that somewhere. The word Colosseum is a Latin noun formed from the word Colossus, meaning gigantic. And it's huge. It once held more than 50,000 people at one time or another. That's literally the Yankee Stadium. This oval stadium was built from cement, limestone, and volcanic rock. Yeah, that thing ain't going anywhere. Historians and archaeologists are still discovering and unearthing secrets of this site. In fact, most of Rome still hasn't even been dug up yet. What? That's right. In fact, only about a tenth lays discovered, with the other 90% still somewhere around 30 feet below street level. Who knows how many wonders of the world lay unearthed. The Colosseum, also known as the seventh wonder of the world, lays megalithic, 615 feet above the ground at the center or heart of the city. It is the largest ancient amphitheater ever built, and it is still the largest standing amphitheater in the world today despite its age. Its use for the last thousand years were rampant with events, festivals, and would even flood its center to reenact naval wars with real ships. How did they get those things in there? I bet that's how they made the bottle and the ship thing, just kinda. And all that water? Just a guy with a giant hose. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, turn it on. Uh, yeah, we're gonna be here a while, guys. We gotta push the play. Number three, boot and rally. The Urban Dictionary added the old boot and rally back in 2002, but Romans, back in the ancient day, they were way ahead of us. Romans knew how to get down, and they also knew how to get it back up. Yeah, ancient Romans would boot and rally in order to continue eating and drinking. What would normally be a red flag at any house party or event was a sign of respect back then. These banquets, these were social events, okay? They were nothing like Tyler's toga party last Halloween. It's not, it's not the same at all. Same amount of puke, not the same theme. Attending these parties was a sign of social standing, so you wanted to be around the longest. You wanted to drink the most, dance the most, converse the most, and... Also, yeah, puke the most. No playing around in Rome, okay? I wouldn't last two hours at one of these. Kyle knows what's up, he's seen it. I bring tums to the bar now, you know what I mean? I'm always prepared. The solution in ancient Rome was actually quite simple, long before tums. See, what you would do is you would excuse yourself from dinner, <clears throat> go across the hall to the vomitorium, then you'd grab a feather, any feather you like, and then you would just go, and then put it back, and then go right back to dinner. Then enjoy more lobster, because, hey, now you made room. Number two. Gladiators. If you've seen the blockbuster hit Gladiator with Russell Crowe, my name is Maximus Decimus Meridius, then yeah, absolutely nailed it, because that's pretty well it. A stew of slaves, lawbreakers, and ex-soldiers, the Gladiator games were one of Rome's most brutal and vibrant live events. Gladiators would be held underground under the Colosseum until they would be called upon to spill the blood of both man and animal in sport. 
Fighters would be matched based on their size, previous record, skill level, style of fighting, and years of experience just like the professional contact sports today. Fighting out of the red corner at 195 pounds, the reigning victor, Spartacus! Oh, you're Spartacus? Oh, sorry. No, no, you're, you're, okay, you're Spartacus. Spart okay. But it wasn't all thumbs down for these fighters. Gladiators were the celebrities of their time. Yeah, you can take that, there you go. Ah, okay, one, we'll do one. Some gladiators even fought years after earning their freedom. Those years did not seem to be that long with the average lifespan of the gladiator, though living just to their mid-20s. I mean, it was, it's pretty physical. The event was not just to kill your opponent. In fact, months of training and preparation was had. There was more of a spectacle of sportsmanship then, most of the time wounding their enemy, which would lead to the slow demise of a fighter, usually ranging between anywhere from eight to 10 fights in their whole career. Come on, dude, 50,000 people cheering you on at the Yankee Stadium? Kyle, Kyle, Kyle. Oh, no, 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 no. And finally, number one, fast food. Imagine getting a Happy Meal in 45 BC. You just get a toy of like Spartacus, just, yeah, that's nice, I'll put it on the window. Romans were indulging in fast food before the eruption of Mount Vesuvius in 79 BC. They were having a good time until they weren't. Archaeologists recently excavated a thermopolium in the ruins of what was once thriving city of Pompeii. We found a snack bar in 2019 and it's since been reopened. Yeah, you can now pick up shifts once again at this restaurant. That was open thousands of years ago. As of last August, the restaurant, located at the intersection of Silver Wedding Street and Alley of Balconies, they would serve pork, snails, beef, fish, you name it. And the corner also doubled down and crushed fava beans, more often than not, mixing them with wine. So it was a good time, it was social. This was bumping on a Saturday night. The closest thing we have to ancient restaurants in Canada now is like, like coffee time. I don't know, every coffee time in Canada looks like it was damaged by Mount Vesuvius. Looks abandoned. The walls are broken in, nobody's working. I'm like, can I get a coffee? Hi, hello? 